like to call to order the Avalon City Council meeting, also to include a meeting of the City Council acting as the Housing Authority for December 19th. Um, if we may please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Put your hand over your heart and again. I, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And we won't be having an invocation, but on behalf of the entire city council and all the city employees of the city of Avalon, we would like to welcome and wish everyone out there in television land and who are here today a very um, safe and happy Christmas and a wonderful new year. Okay, and may we please have the roll call. Council Member Cassidy. Here. Council Member Hernandez. Here. Council Member Sampson. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Olson. Here. And Mayor Marshall. Here. And Denise, it's nice to have you sitting here. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know why you didn't go sit by Scott, but. I know why you didn't go sit by Scott. <laughs> <laughs> I want to sit by Scott. Anyway, we have presentations this evening. Uh, uh, Denise, would you like to introduce? I'd like to introduce Diane Gladwell. She's from uh, Gladwell Governmental Services Incorporated. She first came to Catalina to visit our staff and make her preliminary judgments. <laughs> <laughs> of our terrible record keeping system and destruction policy back in 2015 and we're very glad that we have um, started up again and she's been meeting regularly with us a few of the staff members as well as each department head and I'm gonna let her give a little summary of it thank you Diane Honorable Mayor and Council Members, thank you for having me here tonight. I'm here to help present the records retention policy for the city, which goes over how long different records are kept by different departments and who's going to keep the original. This avoids duplication of effort and um, improves efficiency and lowers the cost for the city operations. Um, I have helped over 200 cities in California do this. I'm a former city clerk of both Glendale and San Luis Obispo, and about 24 years ago, I stopped being a city clerk and started this business so I could be home whenever I needed to for my son, who's in Rotary, along with Ron and Barbara Doubt, who you may <laughs> remember from Avalon. They live down the street from us in Lake Arrowhead. It's a small world after all. And um, so, um, as Denise mentioned, I came a couple years ago and we did an assessment of where you were the, with the records retention program because we didn't want to spend any money where you didn't need to have money spent. So we were assessing where you were. What we're presenting to you tonight, we've met with all the employees. The city attorneys reviewed it. There's one late item that came in. It's just an addition of a CCTV video. Um, other than that, everything's presented in your agenda packet along with a resolution of adoption. And I'm here to answer any questions you may have. And I have my red pen in case you want to make any changes. <laughs> Council, do you have any questions? I have a question. How far back do the records go? Uh, did they go back as far as the city uh, has been an incorporated city? They do, and actually they go beyond. So really? um, I, I will so tell you- So they have records back to 1913? Yes, yes. If you have a warehouse, and actually um, the, the warehouse is the only one that I found a suit of armor in, in the entire state of California, I'll have you know. So, um, but you do have very old records stored in a variety of different places. Our role is to get rid of the junk so that the old records can be properly preserved. And we have a project um, under the direction of the CAO to scan important records in so they can be accessible and searched by the public also. So part of this is identifying the important records and getting them preserved, but you have very old records. And, and mainly those are our city ordinances from when we first became incorporated. Mainly ordinances. Yeah, yeah mainly ordinances. Or you're, you're required to keep the ordinances or the agendas, but everything else. So we have agendas on a regular basis from 1913? No. No. We do not, Joe. No, okay. You have minutes and ordinances from 1913, but probably not the agenda packets. Uh, yeah. Prior to computers, the, and I was trained prior to computers, I hate to admit that, but the practice was to keep the minutes and, and destroy the agenda packets um, in a regular course of business, and they just didn't have a way to keep them and search them 
in a in a in a manner. But now we have deemed to be the council agenda packets are permanent now. So any that we find, and we've got them on the website going back to 2015. So that's awesome. Or or later than that, actually. So you've got many on the website that are accessible to the public, but any agenda packet that we find now, we are keeping permanently. What? Uh, 1915? 2015. I think, I, I looked today, and I think it went back to 2002, but I'm not, I'm not, I know it went back several years for the agenda packets that are accessible to the public on the city's website. I think the agenda I, itself, but not the entire packet. But okay. Close. Okay. I wish we had everything. <laughs> Me too. We need a bigger warehouse. Yeah. <laughs> if we find them, we'll preserve them. So yes, please yeah. do. Because we've been missing some records from the 20s and 30s, which um, we would. It would really be helpful if we had those records. It would. Well, part of the process of implementation will be finding those records, destroying the unnecessary ones, but identifying them and making sure that we know where all your records are. Okay, great. So who makes that decision, what records get taken off or what records we keep? The employees. Uh, well, this will provide the basic guideline. Like we said, the agenda packets are kept right. permanently. But the employees will be trained. They'll have forms. Everything will be done in an authorized manner. So there's a process that they go through before any records destroyed that it's authorized first by by three different people and then um, they'll go through but the employees typically do the assessment we may hire additional staff and I have been hired by different cities to help come help them do the hard stuff so what, what the schedule does is the council sets the policy for right. records that you're going to keep forever records that you're going to keep for three years, five years, seven years after various tra transactions. Um, and after that, then the records can be destroyed. Not that they don't have to be destroyed, but they can be destroyed. So after the council says, here are the records that you can basically discard, right. then city staff will go through those records, and then if they decide that the, we don't need these records anymore, then the city attorney's office has to personally sign off on all the records that are being destroyed. <laughs> Because sometimes employees may say, we don't need these anymore, but we may know of some lawsuit or some matter that is pending. For instance, your insurance records okay. that mm -hmm. you kept from the 1960s and 50s that proved very beneficial to have. Which are permanent. could destroy those, but, but those were kept, and we all know what happened, the good things right. that happened with those. There's actually three signatures before a record's destroyed. And most of, and there was quite a few that when <clears throat> Diane was following the regular guidelines for, we'd go, mm, no, we have to hang on to that a little bit longer. So, yeah. yes, your employees were very conservative. Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Is there any questions? And does the audience have any questions? Okay. Is well, thank you very much. Happy holidays, everybody. You're welcome. Thank, thank you. you. Is there? Same an, to you. Move to adopt the resolution, resolution authorizing records, retention schedules, and destruct, destruction of certain city records. That would second? be agenda item six, number six, six, six. 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 On consent calendar. All second. We've moved and seconded. No further comment. Call for the vote. And five up. All eyes. Okay. I hope the community doesn't mind, but we're going to take a few things out of order. Um, we're going to go to item number 13 first which is the cannabis delivery service application. Yeah, so item number 13 is a preliminary draft of the type of application that we'd be asking people to uh, review, fill out. Um, there's actually two uh, parts of this. There's first there's the actual application, which is in draft form. Um, and then there's also, in, in addition to the application, anyone would have to submit a uh, medical cannabis delivery operating plan um, so that they would describe the application goes to the type of business that they are their experience um, basic biographical information and then a cannabis delivery operating plan would be how they're actually going to operate the business, <laughs> what protocols they, they are going to put in um, so the purpose of this tonight is just to tell you that this is where we are right now. The state of California is still in the process of adopting its own rules and uh, for, um, for licensing providers 
of uh, marijuana and has not completed that. And what is required under state law is before you do delivery service um, or under or recreational uh, service, you have to actually have that state license. And they're still working through that. Um, they're not done yet. So this can be further studied. Um, maybe we want to announce it. Um, you know, maybe notice it more to some of the people that we know are are, are interested in this because it is quite a telephone book full of um, yeah. material. Wouldn't that likely? But we anticipate that the state would be done sometime early spring, hopefully. Okay. So until then, you know, we we can have the application ready to go and we can have some more study sessions on it. But until the state approves its own program, we can't issue any license. Okay. And I know that Council McGugan Cassidy had made comments, and I had to some of the ones before. And I don't know in reviewing it now if you saw a lot of that was was included or or. Mayor, I'd like to say one thing oh, is yeah. that we have Devin Thompson De yes. in the audience. She is the one that actually uh, produced this document for us, and she's worked very closely with Best Best and Krieger, um, Victor Pronto, and Scott on it. So any comments and recommendations you might have made that you don't see in there there's very good reasons of why not and she's here this evening so she could answer anything that yeah any details why that just step up just for just because hi everyone good evening good evening I did go through from the original draft uh, version one and redlined and made a bunch of questions and then I went back through and Compared version one with my ver with my notes with version two, and I still have a significant number of questions unanswered mm -hmm. um, for me. So whether, however you want to do that, if you want me to work with them offline, I can. But some of I at least would like the general public to know what my questions sure. are, and then we can, if they're a longer conversation, mm -hmm. I'm happy to take that offline after this evening okay. as well. If you want to. And I think maybe it is just note taking time because mm -hmm. we're not in a huge hurry to get this done. Mm -hmm. um, so if you wanted to just kind of highlight some of those thoughts, it sure. would be good. One of the questions was about the neighbors. What rights do the neighbors have if they would, if they do not want to have a delivery service next mm -hmm. door to them? Well, the um, per the municipal code, it would have to be in a commercial zone. Mm -hmm. So the impact on a neighborhood or a residence should be minimal. And I know that um, there are areas in Avalon that there are residences in commercial zones. So maybe that's actually more of a, a planning question. If they have any any recourse on that. So <clears throat> secondarily to that, then though, um, you have a, a lot of businesses perhaps business owners that own the land mm -hmm. next to another property. Mm -hmm. So I guess, is there a provision that they could write letters? Like if you if you had a, a dot of a residence, similar to what we do at planning commission level, mm -hmm. if you have a residence and every single facility around that residence says, or around that, that commercial location says, mm -hmm. we don't want to have this delivery service here, mm -hmm. does that hold any weight? Well, there is a plan check process, so I'm assuming that would go before the Planning Commission for their review and approval. The, by far, the biggest limiting factor for any potential business owner will be finding a brick and mortar establishment in uh, the, uh, the commercial zone to establish their business. Um, so I'm not sure how many restrictions you could put on, on that one item. Um, one of the ideas I had with the application is to establish a rubric where you can weight all of those factors, um, the impact on the community, the uh, sentiment of the neighborhood, and then when you all have all of the completed applications before you, you'll be able to see how each applicant ranks in terms of their operational plan, their security offerings, their business structure, and then impact on the neighborhood could be included on, in, in that rubric. And I think it's, it's, it's my <coughs> recollection that you're only issuing one license, right. and I believe that the city council will make that determination. So what will happen is you'll have a hearing where you're going to decide who gets the franchise. Right. The, okay. And those factors will be considered. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, th I thought that I, I can un I understand your questions. Mm -hmm. 
However, I thought the way the ordinance was written, since nobody should be going into that place other than the employee or the owner or whatever, that, and with all the security and all of the everything that's going on, is more than we've asked for any other kind of business. So I, I thought we kind of covered that in the ordinance so that there shouldn't be that concern, but I mean, I'm sure people will still have a concern. Yeah, and so with that, with that comment of the security, um, the question is asked, will security guards be on site mm -hmm. instead of what we said in the ordinance that there, there will be? Not will there be, but there will be. So that, so, that reasoning goes back to my rubric idea. Rather uh -huh. than uh, just writing someplace in the, in the application, uh, security guards are required. We're asking the applicant to actually state yes or no and kind of um, acknowledge that uh, their, their, their response to that question. And then in terms of reviewing the application, if someone puts a no, it's a really easy way to throw out the application. So in, in that way, if you go to the security, um, the security page of the application, I want to say it's on 16 off the top of my head, but it's actually on information page 12 page 12 <laughs> page 12 will outline all of the aspects of security so it even mm -hmm. speaks to um, the, all the aspects of security that are required by the municipal, municipal code so it speaks to the 24-hour video surveillance panic buttons all all those nuances of our code so then that answers the question about whether or not the city of Avalon should or my comment was the city of Avalon should have access to security cameras or maybe written authorization to the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department, but that's actually part of the ordinance. Yes, ma'am. So in all fairness, I did not compare the application to the our ordinance, ordinance. but I, I see the way that you're... Yes, so okay. the reasoning, and then, the reasoning and then was... one of the things is we're also saying that um, the ordinance sets forth the minimum security requirements and uh -huh. so in the security okay. plan, they can go above and beyond that, and then that right. will be a factor that you will look at in determining who right. gets license we just said yeah. no guns yeah in terms in terms of the application I tried to make it so it would be really user friendly for all of us to evaluate the applications compared to what's required by the code so okay. you'll have to seek out that kind of information so then another question was um, we had talked at one point in a meeting um, up here does the delivery have to occur on private property um, and then could it be banned from city property, for example, Front Street or City Hall premises? I thought they had to go to a residence or a building. They can't be passing stuff on the street. They, they have to go to, they, and they'll have to show through their tracking system that they went to 330 Descanso. They didn't go to the front of High Tide Traders. Okay. What about hotels? Right. That's and that was part so, of that, where that comes and from. So, and and that's so okay. hotels can... Can. They can, a hotel can say, yes, we're going to allow this, or they can prohibit guests from uh, receiving it. It's up to each individual hotel or each individual apartment, for instance. An apartment owner could say, no marijuana here as part of their lease. That's private matter between the landlord and tenant or the hotel and its guests. But we, will, we, would, we would, our ordinance allows that to happen but we put it in the hands of the third party as to whether they're going to accept it. We're not, we're not going to regulate mm -hmm. how hotels or landlords um, conduct their business, but we will allow services to those areas if it's if the owner of the property allows. Most things would be best um, being conducted very discreetly, and you know, um, basically where. Um, it's done and nobody knows it. Um, that's the best way. You know, I've had a question about um, something that we've already passed, which is the, like the security. We don't we don't mandate that any other business in this town have a security officer that I'm aware of. Um, and we've taken the ability for the security officer to provide any protection, that is, if there is some kind of a hostile takeover of the of the place. Um, I'm wondering why we're, we're making these people have an, a security guard that's basically unarmed. Um, I, mean, I think that's kind of a good question because now all of a sudden you got somebody standing out in front of the building. Let's say I'm at the whatever address, and now you got the security guy out there makes. 
makes it more obvious if they're not even delivering, mm -hmm. you know, they're, but. We have a lot, a lot of other cash businesses in this town that have way more cash on hand mm -hmm. than this, probably that this place is gonna be. Well, yeah. isn't some of this required by the state? No. Some, well, some security is required as to the, the 24 hour security. That's, I believe, something that the city council determined. Right. Drafted the ordinance. We did, dispensaries, we did, yes. We did I determining did that, determine that, but yeah. I'm I'm questioning it because I've had some people question me about it, and it's like, why do do we make? Because that's a really big expense for um, the people that uh, are going to be running this um, this delivery service. So anyway, I don't I don't know how their business model is going to um, be in the black if they're having to pay probably upwards of a couple hundred thousand dollars a year for a security guard. I, that's an awful lot of money just to have someone standing around um, when, you, when you have video cameras. We have the sheriff's department close by, um, and I know, you know they're probably overtaxed at this point, but um, and it's just nice to know that there's what we have and why we have it. And there, at the time, Councilman, there wasn't, when we read that ordinance a couple of times, there was no opposition by anybody about the security issue. Um, and yes, probably people think about things later. I don't know if we should just finish out this application process and then if that becomes, and, and, I don't know. I don't and know that's what the nice you thing think. about the application is you, if you find the most qualified applicant checks the no box on that question, it can be something that council reevaluates and uh, and uh, modifies the municipal code in that way. Right. Okay. But to speak to the security guard, I think that his role, even because he's unarmed and everything, wouldn't be to necessarily engage with an intruder, but to hit a panic button and alert local law enforcement. You know, rather than right. Getting, okay. Well, the, and let me ask you, the security guard doesn't have to be standing on the outside of the building, no, right? No. The security person could be... Right. Yeah, yes, exactly. Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, the actual... If you look on the security plan, uh, and I don't have the ordinance in front of me, but it says that the security plan should identify a company monitoring uh, the area and provide confirmation that the security company is staffed 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, I have to look at the ordinance, but it may be that you know during operational hours you have someone physically there, but in off hours you just have someone monitoring it right. on a camera somewhere. Right. And I don't right. know. That, you know. Okay. Um, okay. There's also a letter that I received, and I have to um, acknowledge it. And it goes as follows: um, I have read agenda item number 13 on tomorrow's schedule. Throughout the document, it refers to medical cannabis. The state of California has legalized recreational marijuana use. This is what is going to be delivered, not medical. Is there any truth to that? I mean, no. well, no. we're that's where law enforcement will come in. If people are doing that and they're not doing it with people that have legitimate cards, they are in violation of our city laws. And their permits in jeopardy. Our oh, ordinance only allows the delivery of medical marijuana. Cannabis. If the company is delivering marijuana for recreational use, then they're subject to having their uh, permit pulled. Does California um, to make that obvious what's, is in, in the California code, is it obvious what's, that there's actually medical marijuana produced in a facility and this, and this particular product here is not medical marijuana? I mean, is there really, do they decipher one from the well, other? California allows both. And then okay. what, the, what the rule that the state legislature passed was, we're gonna allow recreational and uh, medical marijuana um, in the state, but we're gonna allow each city to determine whether it's gonna have both or none or one. And so it leaves it up to the state. I'm I mean, curious, is there a difference in, between the product? No. There's no difference, okay. So we're, the difference is we just put the a use. name on it. No, the, the difference uses. is you have yeah. to have a card to get you it. You have to have a card to get it. Okay. For medical. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And the application Thank fee you. at some other time we, 
We're going to have that. to establish what that fee is, and part of that is going to be once you have completed the checklist for what we would have to look at, right. then we would determine what the cost to the city is of processing that, and then that fee would be established by the council in a resolution so that you know the city is reimbursed for the cost it takes to do all this uh, analysis of the uh, application the program. analysis and the background checks and right. the whatever and the way and okay now then we are also saying with this that there's no other outside costs because of the operation after issuance that we can can somehow assess to these fees well you can only assess fees that cover your costs any other fees that you put on would be taxes, and the voters could put on a tax. They could put on a, a, a marijuana tax. I understand um, that. But, 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 if, but if we're saying going forward with this, we also, okay, so then it's also the cost of the fire department to go check it out. It's the cost of the sheriff's department to go check it out, and all of those fees. What about the programs? educational programs, safety programs. And so we can't require them, but part of the application that is in the ordinance and it's in the conditions is they've got to provide what their plan, they've got to show what they're going to do for the community in terms of education, um, outreach, anti-drug programs, and you in your determinations to who gets this permit can say, okay, this program's better, we're going to go with uh, this yeah. vendor versus another vendor. So that's going to be on the backs of the business that yes. is in the delivery service. Yes. That's an awful lot to ask, but um, there is information out there that's free, though. That there, or just even the stuff that Rhonda has. I mean, there's a lot of in yeah, but she doesn't operate um, cost free. They they have to pay for that, and the more the more backing they get financially, the better and more effective their programs, and the more broad um, spectrum they can reach. And also the churches need money because the churches can also help out with this as well. So, uh, you know, even a teen center might be able to help out with uh, help us out with this in educating um, the community. Mm -hmm. Anyway, just thought. Okay, good. So with the documents and fees, the um, it's saying for the application process that the um, applicant will obtain a city of Avalon business license and then it talk and then about insurance that um, it says documents may include quotations from an insurance agency but does this mean that so say we have 15 participants who want to apply for the franchise mm -hmm. we're only going to choose one of those applicants so it doesn't make sense for 15 companies to go out and actually process all this document but prior to actually receiving the authorization to move forward they will have to show a proof of insurance proof of workers comp insurance and proof of city license correct mm -hmm. Yes, it would be conditional. Um, obviously, once we get more towards the development of the app, actual application, one factor that you could consider is if they've already got their state license. For instance, mm -hmm. some businesses already have their. Um, well, some businesses may come to you and be have uh, locations elsewhere right, that do right. delivery services, and they have already got their state license. Right. Um, others may be just you know, focused on Avalon, and you would condition the granting of this permit on their getting that, but it's obviously a factor that you can take into consideration when you're awarding this uh, license. Yeah, so when I put together the application checklist, and that's the, uh, the item number four where I'm asking for quotations for uh, proof of insurance or, uh, insur or an insurance agency providing a potential applicant with a, a letter that says that they will insure them, that was kind of, it's, it's the more stringent um, or the, you know, the most, uh, yeah, stringent approach in, in terms of uh, the application. So you could require that from someone or mm -hmm. you could wait until they get further on up the road in the application right. process to, to require that. And then I may have overlooked it, mm -hmm. but um, I didn't readily see that if you are renting a commercial location where you would be required to have a written document from the owner of the property allowing. Yeah, it's, it's in there. It is. Yeah. I, I don't, yeah. I don't know if I missed that. Yeah. 
Yeah. That's a, it is. Where? 15. Oh. Property owner. And uh, so we just put together a sample letter that was just kind of fill in the blank. So you would list the property owner's name and, and uh, it gives space for the uh, property oh, owner's right, name. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah. Okay. I didn't read that the second go. I read it in version one. Um, all my other list of 20, 22 things was addressed. So thank you for adding those into the application. Oh, no, I appreciated that. My pleasure. Okay, so um, we reviewed, we've discussed, we provided comments. And do we want to have this back at the next council meeting? Yeah, well, I, what I would suggest oh, is, oh, and unless there's someone who wants to talk with about this, is that. Um, because I know that there is substantial interest in this in the community, um, we do more, perhaps more, some out, some, some outreach in the newspaper. Say that we're mm -hmm. going to be discussing this process at that meeting, mm -hmm. um, and then by then we'll also have a better idea where the state is, because the state is really supposed to have completed their stuff by January first, right. and so mm -hmm. hopefully we'll have some better information as to how far along in the process is, so that we can realistically say. This is going to occur in June, August, whenever. or whenever. You know, whenever. Whenever. whenever it gets there. Okay. Are there comments from the audience? Right. Okay. Thank you. Devin, thank Thanks, you Devin. very much for working on that. I know it has, it's been fascinating, though, as well, huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Now we're going to go to item number 12. And that's the discussion of, of moving the time of the city council meeting to 5 o'clock. I can't find my name. So, uh, okay, this is from the city attorney again. This is pursuant to your request. Uh, this is an ordinance that would move the uh, meeting time from 6 to 5. So this would, this would be the, for the introduction and first reading. Um, it's all yours to discuss and decide what you want to do I know that there, there's a, um, councilman Samson made the comment about you know keep the way it is and all of that I guess I mean I really would like to see it at five I guess one of the concessions I'd make if it's, it's not too confusing <laughs> <I'm kidding. laughs> you know me I like to kind of go okay <laughs> is just do it do, during daylight savings time Change it to five when it gets dark, and then when it goes back to daylight, when we, everybody can still work in not working in the dark, it changes. That's my only other comment. I, I kind of like that a little more because at, at five o'clock, I'm, I'm pretty much closing shop right there. I mean, that's going to put me out of this whole situation. Five o'clock is there's still four hours of five, six, seven, eight. There's still, still four hours of daylight, so... Uh, that's that's gonna kill me. I'll have to I'll have to do something else. So yeah, because if you can work till six or seven, it I mean I I understand. So I don't know if if that's a if that's not too confusing. If that's a thing, but that's just my comment. So the rest of the council and Denise, you can look at she has got to look at her face and that screen's right in her face, so I can't really see other. Uh, my, I, my only comments to having different times like that there is that just us even having election and us having the polls even though it's advertised all the time the election polls you know we do seven to seven when the county comes in it's seven to eight so then we get residents why what do you mean you closed at seven or the the polling places those are just examples of right. when you make the changes so i think it just needs to be consistent however okay. that's my opinion <laughs> i still like the idea of starting at five and doing all of the a closed session and items like that first and then starting the regular meeting at six mm -hmm. so if we didn't have closed session items That's my then question. we would had just the meeting would start at six but if we had closed session then we would do those first since the public isn't participative in those and Scott's looking, how the hell do I write that <laughs> <laughs> how am I gonna regroup no I'm just thinking how we would write that just like what you said you could how many what percentage of the time do we have closed session meetings 50 percent of the time 50 and what's the problem again 
No, no, no. That, that, no, I mean, what's no. the problem with, with the way it is from the council that doesn't want it? I don't mind the way it is. Okay. I, I like it because, again, wintertime, it's cold, it's dark. A lot of people don't like to come out at dark. The majority cold. of the people that are in our audience are people that, that Snow don't back work. East. I know. <laughs> or, or that uh, the people that don't work or, or people that need to come for business, and that's their business if they need to come to a council meeting. They don't care when it is. They're going to have to be there. That's part of doing their job. <laughs> Um, and it's easier on staff, I think, if we just go from a day at work till there, get it over with, instead of being. Stuck. And I know we want to talk about you know keeping our council meetings down to a, to a manageable number of hours, but when we get out at ten or eleven, I don't know. It just mm -hmm. seems like I had some other. Mm -hmm. Oh, and the, for those people that come to meetings, they can get on a seven forty-five boat and go home. It doesn't cost the city as much money or the, whoever that other person is because they're not getting, having to get a hotel room. And, it's costing and, the city money. We're losing bed tax. <laughs> we're paying for them. We're paying for, for it. Yeah. yeah. We're paying for it. See, see, tonight we could have. We started at 5. He could have gotten on a 745 boat. <laughs> so, I don't know. Again, the community. But I want to have dinner here in Apple. <laughs> Sometimes you, can you can't. Open. Yeah. I know. <laughs> so, anyway. I'd like to leave it the way it is and revisit it in three or four months. Yeah. Because I think, I think the agendas are going to be a little, a little bit more manageable, hopefully. <laughs> we don't know that. Though. Hopefully. We don't know that. I, I, mean, like, I like the 5 o'clock, personally. Um, we've all been there on closed <laughs> sessions when we're making decisions. And we've been here for Related. six, seven hours. And to me, it seems, like, for me, sometimes it's, your, your head's not really clear on ha when you have to make decisions like that in a closed session because you've been here for five, six hours. Um, that would be one of the reasons I'd still like to see it start a little earlier. Well, if we... That would be Sydney's my idea. Thing. And we keep the meeting at six, but we schedule it at five and we have closed session items. That doesn't, have, doesn't change the code. That to get people but, on up 745 But again, like he said, changing it over back and forth is a big thing. Well, so the meeting, so the meeting would start at, oh, yeah, I see. So then if there's no closed sessions, then, then we all just know to get here at 6. All right. Has anybody complained about this, or is this just us? Yeah. No, I get complaints about it all the time. People check out at 830 at night, turn off the TV, and just say, then I spend the next five or six days talking about what happened after mm -hmm. 830 at mm -hmm. night. So, so, yeah. what, so are we going to end yeah. our meetings at 830 now? Or 8 o'clock? No, Joe, that's not what we're saying. What we're saying is we're trying to make it work for us as those of us here making decisions, and we're also looking at what works best for our community. And if we are getting comments on both sides of the spectrum, then we should be taking those into consideration. <coughs> so Actually, We should I maybe mean, let the voters decide. Maybe we should put this on the on <laughs> an agenda on the, um, on the, as a voting um, and let the community decide. Put it on the ballot? Yeah, put it on the ballot. Well, I'm not. The, the other thing is, the people that are home, we start the meeting at 5, and just as you know, how many of our constituents have gotten up in their pajamas and run down here when there's something to talk about? So, if Why they, don't we just have it at 8 in the morning, then? Or at 12 noon? Even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, because... The, I'm, I'm ready. And, there's I mean, we have, that do. They're streaming it live, started. or they're not caring, and they're watching it the next day, or they're asking us what happened it's how many com comments from the audience mm -hmm. <laughs> great compromise then you can go home and get something to eat really quick Oli. right at 5 30. i'd like to try it out so i'm going to make a motion to move the council meetings from five from 6 p.m to 5 p.m and let's give it 90 days and see how it works can we do that or does it have to fully change? No, so what you want to do is you want to give direction to staff, not that you, you're... Oh, you're, I want to give direction to You're not to that. You're right. changing the ordinance. What yeah. you'd like to do is uh, for the next three months um, that we would pursue into the municipal code, which allows you to... It's a regular meeting, give it 72 hours notice, to notice it such that the meeting start at 5 o'clock for the next three months. And then we to see how that see how goes. it goes and yeah. take comments from the public from there. I'll second that. Mm -hmm. That's 
direction for the that's direction. That's what direction. Do you say? Comments yeah. from the community? Nothing. Okay. Other comments from the council? Terrible idea. Okay. Terrible idea, and it's going to kill me. And I probably won't run for council because of it. Next election. The next okay. three months are winter months. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. That's killing me. So go ahead, you guys. Go ahead and have a good time. Okay, let's call for the vote. Three ayes, Marshall Cassidy Hernandez, two noes, Sampson and Olson. What was last time? Good luck, Ollie and Annie. Annie and uh, Richard. Good luck. Okay. Okay, so now we are at announcements and written communications. Are there any announcements or written I have none of either. Okay. I don't either. Department head. Oh, wait. I'm oh. sorry. I do have one. <laughs> uh, you can pull your papers out if you're interested in running for city council. We have the spot of the mayor that is up for a two-year term, and we have two city council member seats that are up for a four-year term. Uh, you could start pulling them as of Monday, and you have until January 12th at 5 p.m. And you come to the city clerk's office, and I'll give you a packet. Okay, uh, department head reports. This is something new that the city manager has uh, wanted to implement, and so that you don't feel like you have to come up and run in with the rest of the audience, you can, you'll have your time. So, uh, okay, I'm still going to limit you to three minutes. No. Okay, no. I, th I think Wait, I accomplished that. With Bob Greenlaw, we can, he needs three minutes per topic. He's got no, a lot going on. I'm trying on. to keep it at three minutes. So, a lot of this, uh, I'm just trying to go over briefly over some things that are happening. So, project update: the 2016 CIP project. The contract work is now completed. We're at punch list mode with a contractor. Um, so that was the sewer manholes, the saltwater valves, and the paving that we saw around the community. We're working on the cemetery road paving. We did that paving on Thursday, came out great. That, well, I'd say five-fold is gonna uh, provide value to the city just in keeping our equipment in good shape comparably to what that road was. Okay, and we're also working, and that'll continue on. We're doing some concrete work around the edges and then some of the concrete work down into the yard. So that'll continue on for about another month with our own crews, and that's not the contractor's crews. The Five Corners project, that's that grant-funded project. The scope is, of course, the pedestrian ways along Tremont and then along um, right in front of our city hall, in front of our property, and reconfiguring the intersection. Right now, the status on that project will work on developing the concepts. And on uh, the second meeting in February, we'll actually present those preliminary concepts and seek direction from council if we're heading in the right direction. And then from there, we'll start uh, talking to the public and the stakeholders involved in the project to make sure that everybody has input into that. Nice. Um, sediment study, we're doing uh, a detailed update and task and schedule will be presented in the January 16th meeting to you. And the same with the development impact fees, detailed update and task and schedule will be presented January 16th. Those projects are still underway, but I'll give you the tasks and schedules on those. Um, storm damage, the recent storms that we had, we had um, a damage to the rock revetment again. We had five locations and we just finished those repairs with the concrete. That was what was holding up those repairs along the rock revetment because um, we didn't have any cement powder actually available because with our one ready mix plant on the island here, there was uh, projects at the trailhead um, at the Zane Gray project and also our other projects that we couldn't get deliveries on the concrete mm -hmm. until uh, more product came onto the, onto the island. And also we were focusing on the South Beach damage and we needed concrete in those locations because we had three holes with significant undermining of the seawall. Uh, the, the velocity of the waves was actually sucking out the sand underneath the footing of the seawall and then it was like a vacuum and vacuumed all the sand that a lot of the sand that we just replaced <laughs> within this last season and then, you know that's not good news but we did go in there <clears throat> and we went two foot deeper than the previous excavations in those holes put rock and con large 12 inch rock and concrete um, to stabilize so that that hopefully wouldn't occur again 
then came up with sand slurry um, with aggregate base and then we'll spread out the remaining sand for the season to make it look like there's sand on the whole beach but it won't be at that level until the next season again and we'll be asking you to be able to put some more sand did that happen on middle beach we did lose sand on middle beach but we didn't have any sinkholes we didn't have yeah so that's that was how much sand did we lose all the sand on middle beach like we did on peach beach and uh, i think we're going to be at the same level that we were last year and that was thirty one thousand dollars in sand that we replaced those are the three beaches and that was just that even if we didn't have the sinkholes that sand just gets up and goes away with that velocity of waves that are coming over the wall but there wasn't as much damage on middle beach no so so the sand that that um is on the lower section of beach which it's almost complete on middle beach protects the seawall obviously i mean me and you stood there and saw that the waves were breaking against the wall on south beach where the sand has dissipated or Mm -hmm. has been taken off and dissipated um both (laughs) factors um and we saw over by the restrooms by the pier the waves were breaking before the seawall so actually that sand on the lower level which i've been saying for years now actually protects the seawall and it protects the entire front of our community yeah. so. and i think well a lot of the the energy was focused the nor either north easter you know waves coming in it was focused on that south beach and then also that revetment on the other side and we saw a tremendous en- uh, energy being dissipated right at that seawall there too that that's because the, the there's no sand there to protect it it wouldn't even be nearly as much energy projected on the seawall if the sand was present down below i hope the doctor jenkins was yeah. able to understand and see how that storm manifested and how important it is for us to have the sand on that lower level, not just for, for liability issues, but also to protect that for, for liability issues to protect the general public, but liability issues um, for um, protecting the seawall and the upper level and to keep us from paying that much money because all that sand that we lost is it i don't believe that we lost as much on middle beach as we did on the beaches where um um, there was so much power projected against the wall it would go up and then it would um the north northeast winds would take it over onto the beach and then would have to be be pulled back into the into the ocean so i'm my, my case is just as strong as it's ever been we need to get the lower section of that beach fixed Yes, and real soon and i and i know you told me that dr jenkins is going to come up with some ideas on how to do that but i think we need to do it sooner than later well that's that's what that second phase of the sediment study is to have all those alternatives so that has anybody you, talked to him since the last time he was here and let him know exactly what the state of affairs of our situation is because it's getting pretty serious now because what we're doing is instead of fixing what needs to be fixed we continue to fix behind the wall, which I think is is an okay idea. Um, that is, if all the sand down below is going to be gone, but it's just going to incrementally um, keep on costing the city more and more money for these sinkholes that are continuously going to keep on appearing. And I think we should just let him know. We need him to come up with yeah, some kind and of I, And I have. And um, also, when we were out there that day viewing the, during the storm, I was taking video, and I did send that to Michael Baker. So okay. for both the mole project and the sediment study, I, that's one of my tasks I was out there doing was capturing that. So I could see it firsthand, but also I could send that video to him. All so right. And more to come on the sediment study when we do that. All so right. that's okay. all good stuff. Cool. Um, and uh, so, then, so you'll see by this Friday, South Beach be back open, ready to go. You'll see Step Beach be back open, ready to go. But it's not going to have as much sand as it did before. Um, and then we'll finish. The last thing we have to do on Pebbly Beach Road 
is fix the shoulders, which will do that before this Friday. So for the holiday here, we should see all that come back together and we should be fully uh, back up to speed and, and beyond the storm. Okay, and then uh, the mole substructure, we have a, an update. Okay, so we're under getting the environmental permit. We're at 30% design. I have the preliminary design report in, ha in hand. I'll be reviewing that this, this week, and then we'll be meeting with the consultants to see what all that means and how, uh, what their projected fixes for the substructure piece of that. So all of their diving, all of their studies, all of that has now put this 30% uh, design together. So we got the CEQA draft document to the city by the 28th of this month. Um, the coastal development permit application were to us and signed by the interim um, city manager. Uh, the Army Corps permit was signed by the interim city manager and then also the regional quality control board. So all the permitting is now going in and being submitted. And then three week look ahead on that. So we'll complete those permit applications. We'll talk about that design report and we'll continue with the various study and the repair plans specifications. Bob, I have a question. So, because I know that has to be done, but all of the things that we're talking about, well, we're not all talking about, but when we were talking about the redesign of the mole and whatever, it would be done in, would that be the same footprint of the, the mole? In the, the second phase, if we wanted to potentially, and that's what we talked with the California Coastal Commission about increasing the footprint of where the ramp is, potentially bringing that up to the same level as the other deck, it's already uh, a disturbed space. Okay. Could we capture that and get that real multimodal facility we're looking for? How do you make your transit buses? How do you mm -hmm. make your tours? How do you make your taxis? How do you make somebody bringing in autoettes into there? How do you make some of your businesses thrive with a better transportation system? Having more space up on the deck could make that happen. Mm -hmm. okay. And the sediment study, whatever comes out of that, wouldn't impact? We are actually, we had a um, phone conference with our consultants considering our sediment study, our mole studies, okay. um, sea level rise, considering all the things that we're working on and making sure that all of the pro uh, projects and products of those projects are being coordinated so that we're not double spending on mm -hmm. those, so that we're aware. A lot of the same consultants are working on the projects, but we're making sure that if another consultant doesn't have that product, we say, here, here is a study. You don't need to do that piece of it for us to pay again, okay? okay. Um, so Vaughn's, um, mostly, I mean, that would be the building department, but as it gets out into the public right away, that's where it involves public works. And then also, I'm the redundant source of inspection if our building official is not on the island. So I've also been covering on that just to make sure on those larger projects that I can get there. Um, but the demo's complete. You see that all the buildings are slicked off to a piece of dirt. And three, four, three quarters of the excavation is complete now. And the new pad will be completed soon. So you'll still see um, trucks, 30 trucks a day for the next uh, week or so coming into the site. And that'll be m most of the stuff that's being hauled in. And that's from um, out at Jordal bringing that in for us. And uh, then everything else will be site material that the dirt that was excavated out of, out of that hole. So realize what the soil engineer was saying is that there was potentially clays down there and they wanted to over X that so that we could get those soils out of there that wouldn't be very good materials to build upon and then place some rock, 18 inches of rock, and that's what we imported and then from their place in compact, 95% compaction, the native material, and then build the pad four feet high. So you'll see a, a grand pile of dirt out there right now. Um, the contractor is loving the weather. The soils engineer, I did meet with him yesterday, and he really likes the conditions out there. He said the soil is great. We didn't find the clays that we were expecting. We didn't find the moisture contents down there that we were expecting. So that's good news because 
after this pad is built, it was anticipated to have at least 90 days of settlement time. So that means there would be no construction and it would just be settling. That may be shortened and uh, that really helps kind of that back end date maybe move up, you know, to a completion because they're looking at this time next year is actually when that store would open. Okay. So be a year of construction. Um, so positions were recruitment for the maintenance superintendent. We received four applications, not as robust as I thought. So I'll be finishing the review of those and then um, interviewing every one of those candidates and see if we can find somebody that could give me a hand on some of our maintenance activity. So realize that we used to have a maintenance coordinator. Uh, this position that we created was to oversee our garage, our public works, and our harbor maintenance functions and to help me out and would be a direct report to me as I'm doing those duties right now in addition to all the construction, capital projects, and being the director. Yes. Um, recruitment for the mechanics. Uh, um, realized that uh, Luis Rubio did accept the third code enforcement position and so he's going to be a code enforcement officer so we're losing him as a mechanic oh. so I guess if a code enforcement vehicle breaks down he can step in and do <laughs> double duty but uh, we're wishing him well on that but we're also got an open till filled um, recruitment out there for mechanics and we are seeing interest and we are seeing good candidates on that so we feel like we'll be successful oh. and the last item I'll talk about is um, a work plan I'm getting a work plan for our department together and that would lay out everything since I've been here what I've heard what I think that we uh, need what I've been told that we need and put that in a work plan and then we can decide we'll talk and then we can decide you know where we draw that line of what we can accomplish you know and so then that would get us that snapshot in the next six months of truly what our focus in public works would be okay thank That's you that was very thorough uh, question Bob before yes. you go uh, do we have to your knowledge do we have anybody exercising the valves yes uh, that's part of the task that ES is delegated to do they do so they yeah. have a, a yes like and a, they even every have four a months or every three months or whatever they do they exercise those valves Yes, uh, they have a schedule and they have a spreadsheet that they fill in when they exercise and if okay. there's anything that they find, um, they report that. Okay. And uh, so, and I can get that to you. That, that's great because yeah. that's the reason we got in the situation we were getting before. Absolutely. But okay, thank you very much. I yes. appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, who's next? Oh. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays to you and your families. Uh, anybody want to go in with me on a stopwatch for Bob? Three minute timer <laughs> on it, uh, something that might. Um, real quick, I'll, I'll, I'll keep mine in three. Uh, Thursday, uh, holiday, we're doing the holiday gift, um, the holiday dinners, the Christmas dinners. Um, thanks for the generous contributions of some of our uh, community members. Uh, we're doing 50 instead of the 40 that we did for Thanksgiving. So there'll be the Teen Center um, on Thursday afternoon. Uh, those families have been notified. Uh, we had some gift certificates as well that'll go out to ones that were individuals that had requested it or just a couple that requested it and they didn't need a, a dinner for four or six. So that's happened on Thursday. Um, Friday, uh, we wrap up our uh, flag football signups, our pre-registration flag football signups for the program it stops, uh, starts at the, the first weekend in uh, January. Um, so Friday afternoon will be the last day for early registrations for that. Um, Friday, we also um, is the last day we're taking um, proposals for our recreation master plan. Uh, we've had an RFP out for the last four weeks. Um, contacted eight to ten uh, companies that do RFPs. Uh, we received two at this point. We're hoping to see a, a couple more come back and we'll get back to you at the first meeting in January in regards to moving forward with that. Um, the first of the year, um, we're planning for January 2nd. I think we're right on track for that. We will be launching our uh, recreation software program. Um, the community will be able to register online. We'll have some uh, community um, outreach there on how to go about uh, registering for a senior class, registering for a teen program. Uh, you can look at uh, what's available, Tremont's available, there's a calendar on there. Uh, it's got some really neat functions. Uh, one of the nice things that will also feature will be credit cards. We'll be able to take credit cards for 
any of our recreation programs and then maybe something down the road that we can do here as well with, with credit cards. And then lastly, I invite you all to uh, join myself and Val, I think I've got her at least in the audience that's going to join me. Um, our polar bears swim, uh, 7.15 on New Year's Day. <laughs> Uh, Councilman Sampson, possibly, 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 uh, 7.15 at Casino Point, and then we'll do a plunge. That's Wetsuits wet are optional, and then we're going to do a plunge on Middle Beach uh, at 11 o'clock. Um, we'll have some refreshments, light refreshments afterwards. So uh, that is uh, bathing suits, bathing suits only for that one. So uh, New Year's Day, um, both of those, 7.15 swim, and then uh, uh, 1 o'clock to kick off your, or excuse me, 11 o'clock to kick off your, 11 your New Year's Day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, finance director. Good evening, Honor Honorable Mayor and City Council. The finance departments have uh, been very busy in the last few months. The audit of the fiscal year ending June 30th is going well. Uh, the field audit just uh, was it just before Thanksgiving where the auditors are physically here looking at our paperwork. Uh, this month we're responding to their additional data requests and we're planning on finalizing the financial statements in January and presenting those to, in the first meeting of February. The visitor generated revenue uh, is, uh, was emailed to you earlier this evening and we'll have that posted on our website tomorrow. Overall, the, the revenue is looking good and on track with the budget. It's 4% uh, higher for the last 12 months compared to the prior 12 months. Uh, cruise ship warfage is up 26% because of the two rate increases that we did this oh. year, this calendar year. Uh, and sales tax is up about 10%, and that's primarily due to prior year adjustments. We hire a consultant called HDL and, and they look at our uh, sales uh, in the city and try to capture more revenue for us and their efforts pay off. Uh, the admissions tax is about the same down slightly but all the others are up by about two to three percent. Uh, we're also on track to present the mid-year financial statements to you at the meeting in the first meeting in February. And that will also start the budget cycle so that we can uh, get a budget to, to the City Council uh, adopted before June. And lastly, we successfully upgraded our financial software at the beginning of this month. We're still iron ironing out a few snags, but overall it's, it uh, responds faster, we're able to run reports faster, and it's easier to export some of the data to our uh, other applications. Great, thank you. Mayor, I need to, oh. I need to go. Okay, um, I Councilwoman Cassidy is going to have to excuse herself. She has to catch the boat this afternoon, or this evening. So I just want to report out that I'll be attending the Gateway City's um, monthly board meeting on uh, Wednesday, January 3rd, and I apologize, but I do need to exit you and catch the boat. understand, Merry Christmas. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Captain Good evening, uh, John Hawking, Sheriff's Department, and I promise I'll go real short also here. Uh, the Sheriff's Department, everything's going well. We've been working very hard. We've been working with uh, choices, and an example is today I was over with Rhonda at the school, and we spoke to uh, a classroom of students. They're basically mentors for students that might be having uh, difficulties or problems and it went very well. Uh, we're also working with the court regarding uh, a juvenile court, a shortstop or a teen court, and as the mayor knows, she's part of that also, and we're trying to put together something that will basically benefit the juveniles before they commit any serious crime. So if they're starting to get off track, it will put them back on, and I do not want to take credit for that. It was the mayor, and Rhonda, it was, it's just a collaboration of personnel that really work good together and come up yeah. with some good ideas. Uh, also regarding terrorism, we recently did a drill with Southern California Edison, and basically the drill was a suspicious package was found in a, on their property in a dangerous area with a lot of fuel and so forth. 
I flew over our department's arson and explosive detectives, and they basically taught the first responders how to respond to a suspicious package that could be an explosive. It was, uh, the whole program went very well. Uh, Southern California Edison, I can't thank them enough. They were, that's obviously one of our critical facilities in the city of Avalon and on the entire island. So it was very, uh, went very well working with them. And a couple noteworthy arrests that we've made in the last uh, week or so. We arrested uh, one person for a possession of cocaine. We arrested a student for threatening a teacher at the school. And we also arrested a person that was under the influence of a stimulant, uh, methamphetamine, and we got them uh, some uh, psychiatric help that they uh, also needed to uh, just try to basically make their life uh, much better. Mm -hmm. And that's a very short recap of what we've been doing. Thank you. I know you all have been busy, so thank you very much. Okay, thank yes. you. Any other departments? We're good, huh? No fire, no harbor, no plan. Oh, there's the harbor department. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council. I'll be standing in for uh, Harbor Master Poindexter tonight. He's feeling under the weather. Oh, yeah, a lot of people are. Um, because uh, of me being called in tonight, I'll be glad to ask answer any questions. I don't really have a, a much prepared for you tonight. Um, I do want to speak to uh, Tim Mitchell's memorial that uh, we had to postpone due to the weather uh, probably 10 days ago. Uh, that's been rescheduled for December 30th, uh, 1400 hours, 2 p.m. And uh, we'll give you more detailed notice when we can. Um, the only other thing I have is that the mooring per permit renewals that we sent out, those have been coming back in and uh, signed and coming in with the checks, so that's quite a lot of revenue coming in. Um, obviously, we've had a lot of weather in the last couple of weeks. If anybody has any questions on that, I'll feel free to answer any questions. Otherwise, I'll defer you know, any technical stuff uh, back to JJ when he's here next, next council meeting. Well, yes, yeah, so after that last storm, and there was that boat that was parked out, that was anchored out at, at Pebbly. Uh, Abalone Point? Yes. And there was all this debris. So I ran into uh, Harbor Patrolman um, Kurt Cameron, and I asked him about that. I said, there's, now there's all this litter, I mean, big pieces of litter, masks and everything else, what happens? And he says, that because it's there, that's the county sheriff's responsibility to, to follow up with that. And I was gonna walk over to the sheriff's, and I didn't, and I don't even know, Captain Hagen, if you're aware of that, but because and whether the person can afford it or not for to extract that, at least that person should be responsible for doing some kind of cleanup. And that's correct. I mean, generally, the city puts pressure on the vessel owner to have insurance that uh, covers that, the cleanup of the wreck. Um, in this case where these vessels stay outside of our jurisdiction, it's difficult for us. It's a caveat that when they come into the harbor, that uh, goes into place but um, in the case of this boater you know it's more they have to take it upon themselves to go collect the debris maybe sometimes they I would assume get somebody to provide them a, a trash can or a dumpster and start loading that stuff in uh, up on themselves but yes uh, outside of our jurisdiction LA County uh, that would be their concern right. I mean now two weeks or however many I haven't been out there but is that stuff probably still, a lot of it still sitting there? Do you think it's all just washed out? No, see? typically it stays on the beach for quite a while. Um, I did have one discussion with the mariner. The mariner um, was able to, from what I understand, cut up his mast or get it out of there. He got some of somebody with a vehicle, okay. and they got the mast off at Abalone Point. Um, there's some wreck wreckage that remains down there uh, on, on the bottom, and then the rest, the, the floating debris, ended up mostly down at Pebbly Beach. Some of it ended up in the harbor, and our harbor sanitation crews have been picking up that on a regular basis. Okay. But yes, uh, it would be one of the things where the mariner would have to be contacted and, and see what they can provide. In a lot of cases, they just don't have the ability to provide that. 
that, and they wouldn't have the insurance. That's probably they one typically of the reasons don't. They're Otherwise, out there. they come into the harbor, right? Uh, to seek the safe res- refuge, right. right? Well, maybe there can be a little coordination and a little muscle or something on the part of the sheriffs if that happens again, so that it's right. Implicit, yeah. Okay. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Is there any other questions? Or? No. Okay. I'm thank good. you. Thanks. Okay. Now we're going to council member reports. Oh, and let's talk to the city manager and city attorney. I have none. Okay. I have none. See, I knew. I had ESP. Okay, council member report. Who would like to start? Well, we can put kind of putting together. I, I don't know if my application's finished process yet, but um, we're going to process. We're going to try to get a little Christmas Eve cart parade down front street or down through the city just go looking through just do uh looking at all the um decorations and everything with all the little kids with my grandkids everybody but anybody's welcome if they want if they have a golf cart decorate it up and follow us and it only takes about a half hour 45 minutes and uh, hopefully everybody will come and join us and have a good time what time is that's that? that's going to be about six thirty to eight thirty, but i don't think it'll be that long <laughs> There's not that many lights up in Avalon. Correct. Other than anyway, that's going to happen <laughs> uh, Christmas Eve on Sunday. Oh, that's where. But What's your starting, point? starting point is going to be on Clemente Street. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, I want to know why I'm receiving information about uh, the casino dock when I thought that was a closed session item and we weren't talking about it. I don't know what you're talking what what do you mean i don't well, i got this memo right here from david and it's basically giving us the inflated price that it's gonna that we're gonna be paying the casino dock and then i got something from you here also that said um let's see it was basically stating that um it's a management update that we're not proceeding on with the casino dock um c- contract because um we're waiting for a negotiation for it or, or i have no idea these these things were sent by david not by me okay so oh it's all it's it's public knowledge now so uh, do we talk about it in open in session or what's what's legal and what's not because I, I got some information here um you know i'm just wondering why can't we proceed with that and and put that put that money in a trust instead of just holding up the whole project because we can't come to an agreement for the negotiation of uh, the casino dock. So it says here over 20 years, um, three out of 3% inflator price, it's starting at $140,000, we're gonna be paying 3,700,000. Um, the two percent inflator price starting at one hundred forty thousand, and it ends at three million, three point four million, and the third one is three point eight two, three point oh eight two million. So basically, it's it's giving us a breakdown of what the city's going to be held to pay over twenty years, um, and it's it's not sustainable for us. Um, and then it gives us some examples of what we can do, like build a bridge from the walkway over to um, to the fuel dock where it is. There's another um, idea of moving the fuel dock somewhere else in within the city. Um, anything but pay the item company that absorbent price for that dead piece of land that um, we don't even really know who owns yet. Um, so I got a problem with that. Also, um, the restrooms down um, by the sheriff station, they're locked all the time. So if you want to use the restroom, you got to go into the sheriff station to get the key. I don't know where you get the key, actually. Does anybody know? Captain Huck- Is the sheriff station? Because if that's the case, nobody's going to be using the bathroom. And the only reason is people don't want to go into the sheriff station to ask for the key to go potty. 
Right. The bathroom that is located on the sheriff's station side, the entrance door, is yeah. open all the time. People can go in and out of that. The other one is locked, and they ask because there was people sleeping in there. Some transients were sleeping in there. In, so in they the sheriff's station, it. in the restroom by the library? The first one. Pat, the, the handicap accessible one is the one that's always locked. Yeah, it's the one right okay. after that is so open So one of them's the open all the time? Yes, sir. Because I tried to get in there yesterday, and it, it was locked, and I just went somewhere else. Okay. Yeah, I, and I, I, that does need to be looked, because I think, though, when we've, because we've had this discussion before, especially when the island company did that with the bathrooms in the plaza, that I think they, the sheriffs were going to lock up that other one at 10 in the evening. It's not open 24-7, is so, it? So make the handicapped people go over to the sheriff's station. That's what we're doing now? Uh, we got to make it easy for handicapped people to, to use the restroom. And I'm sorry people are handicapped. I mean, uh, transients are going in there and taking advantage of it. Um, maybe we should look into that and have those people... I'll like, look into it, sir. No problem. Yeah, arrested or, or whatever it takes. Because if handicapped people are suffering because other people are taking advantage of of the goodwill of the county, um, well, we need to get to the bottom of that. Because I've gotten a lot of complaints from people in wheelchairs that are actually friends of mine that is we are we already have some ADA compliant issues in this town, and not having a restroom, a dignified place where somebody can go and not have to, you know, last for the key like a six year old. You know, I think it would be nice just to have an open spot like that, especially if the county taxpayers pay for it. So, what phone calls we have to make as a council? Maybe Denise, uh, we can call the county supervisor's office, whatever we need to do, but. We got to fix that problem. That's a big problem. And then, what are we doing with the e-buses? Can anybody tell me, Scott? Can you t talk to me about There's that? There's some discussion still going on about whether the fix is, is acceptable or not. Oh, okay. So it's going forward. Yes, it's going forward. I did have a call today from um, Frank Dopp at uh, Transit Concepts, who went personally and checked out the um, the fix. But we played phone tag, Joe, and I haven't spoken to him. Mom. Okay. Okay, so we're still moving forward with it. Yeah, because uh, the community is getting frustrated with uh, public uh, transit service, and uh, it's kind of at a standstill right now, and it's one of those things, it's, it's like banging your head against the wall. It's like it, it, we've, been, we've been dealing with it for so many years, and I'm just, I'm just tired of it. Um, we like the buses, but we don't like the problems we're having with it. We like the fact that we're working real hard, and we the city community spend a lot of money on public transit. But the problem is with the buses, you can get on the buses at Vaughn's and take them over to Marilla Street, and you still got to walk up the hill with your groceries. Um, so we, we need to complete the loop, complete the process, and make it something that the community actually wants to access. Because right now, we've lost all the community ridership. I mean, there's hardly anybody who's going to ride the, the public transit. Um, anyway, that's all I have. Oh, thank you, Joseph. Um, January 4th, I'm going to go to the League of California Cities Los Angeles County Division meeting in downtown LA. Um, and then on the 7th of January, the Contract Cities Legislative Day, where we go up there and rattle the cage of our elected representatives to um, try to get them aware of the city city's issues there's a bunch of how how do we decide what issues we want you to talk on you mean anything you want i mean should should we not kind of maybe asking denise or so we figure out what you're going to be talking about well the, like, what what the legislative it's a group of like all of ben allen's cities that are there we'll go in and talk to ben and give them the general big city stuff. We've already talked to Ben about you know some of our specific needs like the water issues and like the PUC issues. So it's, if, if there's something big you want to bring up, just let me know. Okay, okay. that's on the seventh of January. Seventh of January. Um, and I, I have uh, was contacted by someone at the Island Company who wants to continue the process of fleshing out the Las Casitas. So they want to work with our staff to get it to possibly a point where that 
they'll be ready to come back to the Planning Commission and do a uh, conceptual presentation. Because I think most of us will agree that housing is a good thing, and we need to you know, continue to look at some employee housing. So I would like to say it's okay for our staff to talk to their staff to flesh out that development. I didn't think there was any problem with them communicating with us at all, Lily. But we'll, do you want us to reach out to them, or are they yeah, reaching out we, to us? We could reach out to them because it's—they hit me on the street. Is it talking parallel to the MOU or no? I, I think the MOU is MOU and Tremont. I think right now are on hold. I think we have yes. some differences of opinions, okay. and so I think we've got to work those, through those issues. But I think they still want to flesh out the project of Los Cedas, and I think there's a lot of questions that have been already asked that need to have. The project better defined so we could find out what the answers are. And defined by the planning department. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. That's fine. Yeah. And uh, our household of two people turns into 11 for, starting on Saturday for a week. Oh, every day. <laughs> Good. That's it? Yeah. We have some, here. some people down to your place. We got to, I'm leaving town, so I don't care what you do with our house. <laughs> um, <laughs> last week we met with uh, Catalina Island Medical. Uh, center staff and the CAO and Stacy and David and representative from Supervisor Hans office or Linda and myself and <laughs> LA County Mental Health to talk about uh, still trying to get over uh, get mental health services over here so it was a it was an interesting conversation and the next step is they will be coming and they're also going to be bring. I also mentioned the drug and alcohol thing, so they're also going to bring over public health, I believe. And they're all we're all going to sit around the room and figure out what to do and figure out how to get services to Avalon. Is that kind of in a nutshell, Stacy? Yeah. yeah. Um, the teen court people met. Folks met again last week. Uh, Rhonda, me, Cindy was unable to be there. The judge, Captain Hawking. Uh, some people from Short Stop over town that are representatives of Long Beach Unified School District. They're about, they brought three or four folks from over there. So they're all going to be coming. Is, the upshot of that is, oh, we're going to have the first, the Short Stop program is basically a, more, more of a school run, but also we, sounds like we're going to be referring them even from law enforcement. They get into a little bit of trouble. And it's two three-hour classes. The parents are involved. Uh, there's homework and whatever, but try to get some of these, just the kids are at risk, to try to get them to turn around a little earlier. So we're looking forward to that. We'll also be recruiting. They, they usually have two people that are trained to run the groups, and I think they say they eat, they bring over attorneys even or something, or couple, one of those gentlemen for sure was. But they also may be looking going forward that we, oh, God. That chiropractic work didn't quite work on my back. It just got a twinge. <laughs> twinge. Uh, but we may be training people locally to do those classes, so then there's not the expense and whatever involved in bringing these folks over. So anyway, more of that to come. There will be advertising and all that other good stuff. Um, and I met with Vicki Johnson of the Chamber of Commerce um, because um, Jim Luke Johanna has very, been very busy with personal issues. We we met and started talking a little bit more about the the art commission. So I did look up Vicky's in the audience. I did find some things that I will be sharing, but I'll be gone for ten days. So we'll get back after the first of the year, and I will be gone. I'll be back on the thirty first. Hey, that's it. Oral communication. This is an op opportunity for members of the public to address the council on items that are not on the agenda. You will be limited to three minutes, and no action will be taken. Okay, seeing that. Consent calendar. We only have 10 items on the consent calendar this evening since you already did item number six. The first one is actions of December 5th, 2017. The second one is to approve the total expenditure amount of $2,185,964.93. The third item is to appoint a voting delegate to the Gateway Cities, um, yes, sorry, the GWMA board member. That's a, another alternate to replace David Jenkins. The fourth one is to request uh, to solicit proposals. We have three contracts that are due, say, between March uh, 1st and uh, April 15th, I believe, and that is for our public trash collection, the yellow jacket <coughs> mitigation. 
the public restroom cleaning services and the management of our public showers at Casino Way. The fifth one is um, to authorize expenditure of not to exceed $6,000, and that's for our temporary holding facility for the animals. We found a great location out there at Roaring Canyon, and we're very pleased with that. Okay. That 6000 does not include the uh, work from Public Works, so okay. that's just for materials. Number six, you already did. Number seven is to approve the addendum to uh, number two to my first amended employment agreement for the Chief Administrative Officer. Number eight is the 2018 Waterside Permits, and that's to authorize the Harbor Master to renew the attached list. Number nine is the authorization to continue the monthly artesian market on Crescent Avenue. The number 10 is to ratify prior actions for the patrol boats number three and four. Those expenses have already been spent. And so it's to also to amend the fiscal year 1718 budget to increase the amount by $18,000. Number 11 is uh, the City Council acting as the Avalon Housing Authority, and that is to adopt the resolution approving the Housing Authority Successor Agency's annual report for the fiscal year 16-17. Okay, Council, it's your pleasure. I would like to pull item number three. Same here. I'd like to pull number nine. Number nine. And I would like to just ask the question question of item eight, which is the water site permit. Okay, is there a motion on the other ones? Well, at least if you can get it, <laughs> you got it. I know you're good at this. Uh, I like to move staff on one, two, four, five, four, five seven, nine, no, uh, ten and eleven. We already did six, so five. Right. Seven. Very good, Oli. I'll second that. Okay. Is there discussion from the audience? I'll call for the vote. Okay. Eight. Four ayes and one absent. Council Member Cassidy. Okay. Item number three, I pulled it, but Joseph, did you want to, Councilman, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I'd like to know. How do the voting? How do the voting? Um, um, is it, it says appointing a voting delegate. So that concerns me because I don't I don't understand. Does the city have a policy on how we look at our water and how um, the decisions are made and how the agenda is brought up in the Gateway Regional Integrated yeah. Water? management joint powers of authority so I just like to know how they come up with their agenda and then how our representative represents us and what we feel about the items that are brought to their attention so because there this person who we're put appointing on this board and as you know, I'm very passionate and con concerned about our water, um, not just for the island, but for California in general. And um, I just didn't, I, I've never heard it. I mean, we've had somebody in this, in this, um, um, position. Yeah. in this position for quite a while, and I've never heard any kind of, um, um, feedback from the meetings that have transpired. Can you speak about that? Can anybody tell me about what this board represents and how they come up with with their agenda? Well, yeah. I'll attempt to. Of course, I was appointed as one and being a new employee at the uh, the city here. You know, I haven't been to one of these, but my understanding and talking to Jordan Moreau that we wanted a seat at this table to be able to bring potential grant funds and make everybody aware that Avalon existed on the map because in all of LA County, we didn't even exist and it didn't give us that source of grant funds, the availability of grant funds by being a member on this and having 
people being voting members of the board, it made us eligible for that. So it put us a, a seat at the table. And so, um, and that's not that I, I, by the time that I do attend as one of these alternates, I'm going to be more up to speed on it. But that's what I can talk about tonight. Seat at the table costs us $15,000 annually, correct? Yes. Yeah. Um, that's what it's anticipated that it would be if we attended every meeting over there. Or if we don't attend every meeting. Is it, I, I don't get it. Uh, oh, is that the cost of travel? And yeah. No. And yeah. Jordan can also speak Thank up. you, Jordan. Okay. Okay. Is that the cost of travel? In no, that's uh, fifteen thousand dollars is the membership dues for the board. We approved that when we first joined. Uh, in uh, two thousand fifteen. Yep, two thousand fifteen. That's what we brought uh, to the council as part of the budget. Okay. Um, what happens is that uh, pay, pays for the executive officers of the GWMA, who then work on behalf of all the representatives of this group to pursue water funding opportunities for this group. Irwims were created uh, to recognize watershed areas um, and how they have relationships, but each city or water board may not talk to each other. Mm -hmm. Our part with Avalon and Catalina Island is we're an island, so we're not directly tied to any geographical watershed. So politically, we aligned ourselves with the Gateway Water Management Authority because we're part of the Gateway COG, and this is a sister agency to those. So then it allows them to, like uh, our works director uh, Bob said, was keep us on the map. Um, right. There are funds specifically earmarked for IRWIMS uh, through all the different propositions and bonds that if we're not a part of one, then we're not eligible for that money. Right. Uh, an example is when we first joined, uh, they were finishing up Proposition 84 funds and had a smart meter grant that the uh, uh, gateway uh, was applying for. So to upgrade meters to smart meters, which helps efficiency and understanding of water flow you know, on the residential side and commercial side, uh, and one of their cities had dropped out, and they said, Avalon, can you step in? And so we stepped in, brought it to council, approved a resolution to be a part of this funding. Uh, unfortunately, when it came out, the um, cost of the program, we still had to pay in money. Edison wasn't ready at that time to move forward with smart meters, so we couldn't get those funds. But the point being is that when funding opportunities come up like that, we're eligible for it. And so uh, Gateway sets their agenda. Uh, board members uh, can you know, raise issues, raise concerns, um, you know, say what's in our need and our interest. Um, at the time, just before I was taken off of the board previously, we had been having meetings with Southern California Edison on a monthly basis um, and reported out after these meetings because we were coordinating our effort to share in funding opportunities and projects and how those can match up and how we could help each other. Um, we had started sending over those uh, meeting notes to council uh, but then that ended um, about July of last uh, last year. Uh, and so there was no more follow-up at that point after that. I anticipate if we're able to start with the meetings with uh, Edison again, or if we, um, you can even report out after Gateway. The hard part is, is most of the time, Gateway meetings don't directly affect us because, again, we're an island and we're not directly affected to the 710 corridor or any of those projects. But if we don't participate and we don't attend, then we'll never get any funding, and uh, we won't be eligible for any fund opportunities. How often are the meetings? Once a month. Okay. Um, yeah, I think it's a good thing, and I think you're a good representative for the city. I just want to make sure that we have, that we're kept in the know on exactly what's discussed, and if, if it has anything to do with us, or it might have anything to do with us, and then how, how much... Um, of the city's um, um, resources are being put into pursuing the grants because I think that it's important that we pursue these. Um, but that's that's the nice thing about being part of this organization is we don't have to use very many city resources to pursue funds. Okay. That's what this group does for on our behalf, and they're subject magic experts, right. whereas we may not have the expertise or experience to navigate the complex world of grant fundings and what opportunities are available, uh, they do that for us. And they do that on behalf of the board. And some projects they may do for a specific uh, set of cities or a region, or it may be a project like smart meters that a lot of different people can come a part of. But most anything that requires a grant funding requires ultimately council approval. So if you were to get involved with something to the point where, like the smart meter program, we brought a resolution to you for approval 
to say yes, it's okay to be a part of this funding pro, um, you know effort, and then we would move forward because at that point it would take more staff resources to follow up with it. But on the routine kind of day to day elements of it, you know we could pass you along the agenda so you could just see what's on the agenda and if anything raises your attention, you could get a hold of us. We could, I'm sure we could do that. Um, yeah, that the that agenda is only great. sent out about a week before the meeting, so yeah. there's not a whole lot of time, you know, for a comment, review, follow up, and things like that. Yeah. But again, it's not necessarily too involved unless it gets to the point of there's an actual funding opportunity, right. at which point we would be involving council anyway. Okay, okay that's thank great, you. man. I appreciate your insight, and thank, thank you. you for coming out from there. And Did, we can also ask staff to give a summary of the meeting when they come back, and provide okay. and to provide it to the council. Mayor yeah. Pro Tem. I just have one picky question. Um, so on the resolution, after the effective date of the who's going to be the representative, it says to apply for funds available to the city of Avalon allocated for transit improvements. <laughs> Whoops. Yeah. That's very good. Huh? That's very good. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> well, and along that line, um, and I talked to the uh, city manager about this. Because Jordan was so much involved with the water before, and because Audra is involved in a lot of all the transportation stuff, I would like Jordan to be the initial contact, the initial person, and then Bob and then Audra or whatever other order we want to do the next two. I know I'd be pulling him away from you for, for a day a month, but um, I think it's important that since he's kind of been our water guy, that I would really like to see him have that role instead of Audra. So change the resolution to reflect that Jordan Monroe would be appointed as the board member representing the that's city, it. and the other two would be the alternate. That's what I would like to have, yes. But up to the council. Fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's okay. Good. Move the amended resolution. Move the amended resolution from Oli, seconded by? Myself. Okay, moved and seconded. Comment? Call for the vote. Um, comment. Uh, are you, did you speak to this guy that um, I referred you to? Um, he's supposed to be working on getting grant money, no charge to the community. Um, I, I, Is that the guy that came over to visit? He came over to visit. I had a, a packet from him. Um, we made initial contact. I think we need to okay, re-engage. He, yes, he's but, get, get, getting back to me and he he swears he can help our community at, at no cost. Okay. Um, we'll make another contact um, with him tomorrow. He can then. get us grants. Oh, okay. And I believe that that's an area that we you can use some help in. Absolutely. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to get him to call you again. And it would be nice if you arrange a meeting with him. And I will attend that meeting. And then we can, we can start moving forward on the things he can help us with. Okay. Because we need help. Okay. And he swears he can help us. So. Yeah. We'd love to leverage our dollars. Okay. Yeah. Grant funds yes. too. And, and they've provided yeah, billions of dollars in grant money to um, cities throughout the throughout California. Mm -hmm. um, I'm I'm really sold on this guy. So yeah. great. Okay. And item number eight. So the oh, vote sorry. is four eyes. Just so. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <laughs> okay. Moving right along. <laughs> item number eight. Um, my question was is. For, for uh, Finance Director Bob Mesher. Uh, there was, oh, I know, or, or you. It, it, it's kind of a fiscal question. Uh oh. But, but you would know too. Is everybody, with the exception of Island Enterprises, I, I'll go there in a minute, is everybody paid at? Bob Mesher. Yes. Oh, sorry. Okay, no. Okay. Yes. You both know everybody's paid up. Yeah, JJ uh, checked with their office and everyone was uh, paid up with the exception of the amount that was determined in the most recent uh, city council meeting for the island enterprises. So that has not been paid yet. Okay. But everything else is up to date. Okay. But there is a line on the staff report that says, with respect to fees, rents, and admission taxes, good standing includes execution of and compliance with a payment plan. Nobody's on a payment plan right now? Not to my knowledge, and 
I should be knowledgeable yeah. about any payment yeah. plan. And the, and the payment plan is if they have arrears or whatever. Okay. All right. So with regard then to Island Enterprises, because, well, and I guess, and Haley's here, and I don't know why Haley's here, but she could talk. Uh, I was just curious if there was a need for a payment plan, if that would be something that would be entertained for that $52,000. I mean, and I don't know, again, I don't know what Haley's here for. Well, I'm actually, good evening. Good Mayor, evening. Council members. Uh, I'm actually not here about that necessarily, I mean, partially. Um, but we just received this um, last week, I believe, our amount that is supposed to be paid by December 29th at 5 p.m. It's close to $60,000. Let's talk about fair. <laughs> Let's talk about this theme of fair that the city likes to talk about. Um, if it's not paid by then, that's what I want to know. A clarification. Are we not running next year? Is that what the city council is telling us? Is that what our elected members of the council are telling us, a small business in Avalon, that uh, we're not going to be able to run? If we can't come up with $60,000 or just shy of $60,000 in the dead of winter? That's why I was asking the question, and when I had the thing about payment plan, okay. that's what I was curious yeah. about. That's yeah. That's I mean, it, it's a huge concern. I don't mm -hmm. have sixty thousand dollars laying around. Do you? <laughs> yeah. You know, we're not. We're not. Uh, I'm not sure which company you think that we are here, but uh, we're very much a small, small business that has been fighting for years to run a successful business here in town, and uh, the council's kind of against us all year long. So that's what I'm trying to find out. Um, another condition on here, if we're going to be talking about the water site permit, and if you don't mind me stepping outside of financials, is uh, the special condition, and I'm assuming it has to do with the recent water site permit that we put in, considering that I just got a letter from uh, the Harbor Master as well, um, that states that if we are asking to modify our project, which I also find it very funny that the last meeting, JJ specifically came out to ask me if he could contact me to discuss the application further. I was never contacted, but instead received this application telling us that if we wanted to bring in these vessels to replace two of the five that are going to be on this new waterside permit, um, that now Island Enterprises is going to be asked to pay for a uh, harbor congestion study to be done. When was the last time you asked another company to do that? Let's talk about FAIR. Did you ask Catalina Classic Cruises to do this when they brought in their tenders and clogged up float four and five every Monday and Tuesday? Did you ask them to do it when they kicked off other businesses that their waterside permits stated they had to land on float four and five? Talk to Bob Kennedy. They didn't even want to run on Mondays and Tuesdays because they literally could not land to function on Mondays and Tuesdays because these vessels got brought in. So why are we being asked to pay for a congestion fee? And again, it's ironic because years ago, Island Enterprises, or at the time Island Navigation, is the one that asked for this congestion study to be done. And now we're going to have to pay for one? I've never heard anything about that. I would like to just clarify one yeah. thing. Um, yeah. Ms. Stickler just said that they're replacing two boats. It's not like for like. Uh, I believe that what they were proposing to bring in was um, larger size. I cannot speak to the actual, all the facts of it all. So if this is something that you need to hold over their waterside permit so we could have the harbor master in um, President, oh, JJ was homesick tonight, so yeah, he could what, not what I can tell you is, is that the harbor master uh, indicated that there were two new larger boats that would be some of the largest boats in, in the, the harbor, harbor, and was expressing concern about with these two new boats that would be so, so substantially large that we would have to do a congestion study. They? How about yeah? How about I clear this up? Be, I'm happy to tell you. In fact, I told Annie about it the day that I turned in the application. Mm -hmm. One is a 50-foot vessel. Okay, so a 50-foot vessel is the same size as the Sea View, just right. to give you guys an idea. A 65-foot vessel, same size as the Nautilus. So Not uh, much larger, or any larger, than any of the island company's boats, the Cadillac, or our current vessels. 
So is anybody else being made to pay this congestion fee in, in the harbor? Orrin, do you know? result of the fact that currently if you if you look at the harbor in the summertime look at the harbor throughout uh, our busy periods um, we've got a lot going on and um, so I would say there's overall an opinion that a, some sort of study should be done before we uh, go increasing the size of the vessels and adding more so vessels we haven't done a study yet uh, right no the yet study is yet we're giving applications or well I think the idea certain companies pay this congestion fee. I think the idea is more uh, spawned by the the fact that the say the sixty five foot cat catamaran vessel that's coming into the pier. There's kind of a choke point uh, on the Joe's rental boat side um, that we have to con we're really concerned with. Um, you have uh, people in paddle boats, people on stand up paddle boards. And these are major size vessels that are operating alongside the pier. They're in gear. They're backing down. Um, they're loading passengers. And then at the same time, we have people in kayaks, people in stand-up paddle boards, people maneuvering around these larger vessels. So um, it wouldn't would be prudent to, to think about the study as a, a way to understand how we're moving forward with all this activity in, in a safe manner. And how much did we, was there any thought to how much a study like this would cost? I have no information on that at this time. Sounds but, like. But, oh. but this company's already being held to the fire to, to, to right. so I, with some kind I, of. I see that as a term if they want to add these two additional vessels, these large vessels, that the burden it looks like is being placed on them. Are we doing that with any so, other boats in the harbor? Like let's say the cruise ship boats or the Catalina Express boats or the Cadillac or the Island Company boats? No. All those are existing permits. He, yeah, but they're part of what's going on right, in there. Right, they should the, all what I'm getting simultaneously at is, get this information. Yes, sir. But yeah. they were approved previously. This, these are two new additional vessels. I, we've asked this question before. Okay. Where are we, when are we going to start vetting the concerns of an overcrowded harbor? So I guess that answer is right now then. Yep. Better now than ever. But, but if, if they're going to get some notices to, to um, conform, then everybody else in the harbor needs to get them too. Because we're starting here, so let's start with everybody. Let's see what Cheryl has. Well, I, I was just going to mention that the two new boats would be running off of the Island Enterprise and float in the summer. That That's where the biggest concern is. And what about moorings for those? Because we tried to give them two moorings that we didn't have. <laughs> so they, what they would, happens they'd, to they'd be paying nightly as well for those. Okay. But that's not before us today. It's, it's what? That is not before us today. Those two vessels are not before us today. No. That is correct. Okay. They are not. Okay. So, and we have no idea what one of those congestion studies would cost? We do not at this point. Okay. No. I personally don't feel like you should put it on their back, but because somebody else is going to come up to us someday and go, well, what about, what about me? Well, I, the, the idea is um, we need to do the congestion study. We, as a city, yes. need to do this before any larger boats like that are added to our pier that is very congested and the mole that is very congested we agree with that they are congested yeah and before any boat is added that large we need to have this study done they can certainly just <coughs> wait until we've got the funds and the opportunity to do that mm -hmm. we're just saying that if they want to do it now they're going to have to participate mm -hmm. in that I mean because the city's going to need to move Right. I mean, the city, we need, should no, move forward with I that. Know. Well, and even if somebody says, I want to add 30 kayaks to my fleet, or Joe Renaboat says, I want to add two or three, that's all impact. So right. it's it, big or little. And, and there's actually a limit on non-powered boats. Okay. For now. But non-powered. But maybe we'd find out that there's a study yeah. that we're not congested or, you know, probably Yeah, and, and catamarans are, you know, quite a so bit the, wider than yeah. So there's a limit boats, on, so. um, like, 
paddle boats and paddle boards mm -hmm. and kayaks? There is. Oh, really? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's good. I believe it's 116. I'm not positive. 116? Because yeah, the, Phoenix, the Phoenix was a big boat. It was not that maneuverable. Mm -hmm. And how big was that? Over 100, 60, 80 feet, at least 80, 90 feet. That used to come in the harbor a dozen, a dozen times. Where, where the Phoenix mm -hmm. was, there's two floats now. That's where with the island company floats, so they could tie the subs up to it. Okay. The Phoenix just tied up by the pier. Uh -huh. I, I think Richard's got to hold it over for. I I kind of would like to hold this over till we get the harbor master here and, and get a little more information on everything. If that would you're be talking okay about with... the regular waterside permit, yeah. because we're we're not bringing we're not bringing the modification permit before you today. Yeah. Okay. It's it's just their standard right. waterside permit that they've already already been approved for. And that was for the five, was adding the five shore boats under 30 feet. Right. So maybe we could, and, and you approve it with the special conditions minus um, item number nine, because if they have to modify the permit, number nine could be brought back. Correct, right. Cheryl? Item number nine. Item uh, number nine number is nine the, the special conditions. For the congestion fee. Oh, right, yes. Also the $56,000 at the next. Well, days. the issue for that one is. I, I would like to see if, since we say that we will do, if they're amenable, I think we should do a payment plan. Well, the, if, if they the, contact the finance department, I'm sure that Bob would work something out with them. Yeah, the, the, the point being is that the city council voted to uh, charge them the amount that we're mm -hmm. stating here. Yes. Um, all we're putting in, the, in this item is saying that they need to pay that in order for their permit to be valid for next year. Because everybody else has. As everyone else needs to do. I understand. And, and if, if they want to come to the finance department to work out some kind of a payment plan, that I'm, I'm open to that. Okay, great. That's a good idea because I'd like to make some direction that we absolutely let them make a payment plan because I don't think that they actually budgeted this money in their, you know, I. I don't know how anybody possibly could um, at this point. Um, they're not contesting the fact that they owe it. They're just asking for some lenience. And I'm saying I think we should give them that. Um, so the like appropriate motion would be then is you would amend condition number seven, that they either have to pay the fees no later than December 29th, 2017 at 5 p.m., or enter into a, a payment plan uh, approved by the finance director uh, as of that date as well. So with the reason, okay. within right. reasonable time. Within, well, no, no. within reason. By that date. Yeah. By that date. Correct. And that the finance director would approve whatever that, that payment plan is, but it's got to be. Come back. Got to be written down. It's okay. got to be done by the end of this year. Is that reasonable, Haley, to work with him, with uh, the finance director? Sure. That sounds reasonable to work up a payment plan. Um, but again, with the whole thing of fairness, we all ask about, you know, what does everyone else get to do? Well, uh, let's, it's already been voted on, so it's a moot point, but the $56,000 and being charged square footage, no other float in the harbor is paying that. Um, the repair barge pays a lease mooring rate. We all know this from several meetings that we've had earlier in the year. So, but now we are uh, stuck with this huge bill. We have our own float that we maintain every single year. We built, we pay a 7% use fee, and we maintain it. We still pay it to the city during the months that it's installed. And we're being asked, and the example was that we pay the same square footage as Eric's on the pier. On the pier. We sit in water. We don't sit on a city structure. The mooring gear underneath of us, we pay for. We install the float. We replace all the chains. It's not fair. It's just not fair. And a council member mentioned it. There's a lot of money on the table, so let's go after it. What kind of city council goes after a small business for more money instead of what the right decision is? You guys are just not doing so good in my eyes. And it's not just our company. And I'm sorry. I know that we've had conversations before, Annie. But you know what? When I get comments made to me by council members asking if we're glutton for punishment, I take it personal. 
I walk into a council meeting and I get asked by city staff if I'm just here to moan and groan about how things aren't fair. I take it personal. We're being attacked. That's the way I see it, and that's the way other members of the community see it as well. It's not fair. And if we can't resolve it here, then we'll have to resolve it outside. I don't know how that's going to happen, but somehow we are going to come to an amicable agreement. The log said that we made one in the last council meeting, and that is incorrect as well, which is not unlike the log to post false publications, but they're more than welcome to reach out to me. They're more than welcome to call me. I could give them my cell phone number. It's public knowledge. It's 714-325-0061. Anyone wants to call me and ask me about this, go for it. My phone is available. It's in my back pocket right now. <laughs> um, but I'm just, I'm just so disappointed with all of this. I've had it. Literally, I was told, go for it. Let them have it tonight. This is not the town that I brag about to people on the boat who tell me today, a mother and their son, this is their first time to the island and they are so excited and I give them restaurant recommendations. Yet here I am trying to provide entertainment for these visitors coming to the island and you guys are just tearing us down because you want more money. <laughs> tell me how that's fair. That's all. How, Thank you. Let me ask you something. How how is it that the repair barge pays a lease a lease fee yet they have to pay square footage? Can anybody explain that to me? Joe, that that issue it, we're not comparing apples to apples and that issue was so many years ago. I could certainly pull out the file. It's about that thick. It came to council so many times, that mm -hmm. whole repair barge issue. <laughs> I could certainly get you an answer on that, Joe. Yeah, I, that I, I, I would just be guessing tonight and I don't want to do that. Okay. But as I brought up before, the yacht clubs have private floats in. Joe's got a private float in. Hamlin Co's got a private float in there. And none of those guys are paying anything. And I think if we're going to charge somebody something, we should charge everybody. Because they're all sitting over our dirt. Well, the motion before the council is on this waterside permit, um, because you already established what the fee would be at the last meeting, is to whether you want to allow them to negotiate a payment plan with the uh, finance director. Yeah, absolutely. I'd, I'd like to make the motion as you described it. Um, and I can't repeat what you said, but I can say that, the, that you do have to speak to Bob. Do you remember the um, element that you have to speak to Bob before, I believe, the 29th? Yes. And then agree to the lease terms, and then Bob will give you an extension or some kind of a payment plan. That's absolutely um, reasonable. And we're not, we're not here to tear you down. And if any staff member is making derogatory comments that make you feel um, uncomfortable, I'd say you take that directly to me and I will, I will do something about it. Not to directly to my staff member, but I will take it to, um, to their um, manager and I will have that dealt with. Thank you, Joe. Uh, I will say that I only bring it up because I think it's unprofessional. Um, I really have much thicker skin than that. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, no, but I don't think anybody so, should make you feel inferior in any way, shape, or form. I you're, don't. You're a very good customer of ours, and, and we you. value your your patronage toward the community and what you've provided this community and your father yeah. and your whole family for the generations. And if somebody's not making you feel right, and I'm sorry that we've had to come to terms with what we've had to do with your businesses recently, and it's and it, and it's it's a shame, but I think we can go on. We can live through this. You got your company can survive. Well, I, I hope so and thrive because you have to keep in mind that yes, I am second generation here in Avalon, and this business is what I intend to continue doing. But as I have mentioned before, during outside conversations, the way the city is going and the way they're voting on projects, not just ours, but all projects, I don't know that that's possible unless I jump ship and work for the city or work for the island company. 
I don't see a future here in Avalon the way this council is going. And it's very sad and very unfortunate. It's true. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Okay, there's been a motion. There's a second. <coughs> I'll second it. Oh, did you second it? He seconded it. Call for the vote. Three ayes, Marshall Sampson Hernandez, one no, Ole Olson. Okay, so item number 13. No, oh. item number nine. <laughs> number nine. nine. <laughs> yeah. Hello, Nan. Uh, good evening again. Uh, before you is a recommendation um, to uh, move forward with the artisan market that we have started. Um, we've got about three months of, of running uh, with it. Um, we've had some success. We've had some some negative feedback about it. Um, it's kind of spelled out in your in your staff report, but in general, the idea uh, blossomed from uh, some comments from the community to try and bring back the farmers market. I think that once took place in the Metropole Marketplace. Um, we uh, pursued that, pursued those avenues, um, didn't get anywhere with the person was doing it at the time. Um, we got a little bit of feedback, uh, but not somebody that wanted to, to continue it. Um, had some citizens in the community want to see us pursue uh, a market of some sorts. Um, together, a collaboration came uh, to do a farmer's market along with an artisan market, bring a local artisans uh, in as well. Uh, to have enough of a uh, platform to, to provide a market of some sort. So that's how we came up with the artisan market. Uh, we started it in September, um, had a, a September show, a monthly show in September, October, November, had 10, 11 each of the, uh, the three months. Um, the original plan was to try a 90-day you know, period, uh, reevaluate, and that's kind of where we are now. Uh, I have been requested to uh, make a a chamber meeting in regards to it. They had some concerns about uh, some of the, what they felt some of their, their members as unfair competition. Uh, not so much with the, the food that was being provided. We had fruits and vegetables. We had some baked goods and those types of things um, as some of the artists uh, that we had there. Um, their recommendation is that we, you know, take it off of Front Street, you know, take it uh, back up, you know, possibly up here on a Thursday night. Um, my general feeling was it wasn't wouldn't work up here. We needed the traffic of both the uh, the tourists that we had coming through as well as the 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 locals, um, the community at large. So um, I met with them. It was about a week before our Thursday. It was a week before our uh, November uh, market. We had already put it out, so we did go along with the the November market. Uh, let them know that I would bring it back to council, and here we are for you know for this discussion of whether it moves forward or not. Uh, well, one of the things I heard, Dan, you know, some of the people that already established businesses in town, they're paying a percentage to the city, mm -hmm. and apparently, with all this, they're not, they're not getting a percentage, or they're paying a percentage off to the city at all. Any of the vendors? Uh, they they're just paying the booth rate. They the, just pay a booth rate, the fifty dollars booth rate. People aren't paying a percentage to the city of Avalon. No, that's what I'm saying. No, the I mean, vendors, the, the, but there's people who have businesses that are established. They pay a percentage of what their percentage Oh, percent not, not to the leases. not to the city, but to their landlord okay. per se. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was one of the one of the things that I heard mm -hmm. about it. Um, they all have business licenses. Uh, we did ask for business licenses. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, it's 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 competition against the people who basically have established the community, um, and I. I'd say, and uh, the food, the food stuff, I think is good. I'm not sure about I'm in the middle of town, but I do like the farmers market idea and the coffees and the and the honey and the and the breads and things like that. I, I think that's okay, but um, maybe not so much in the middle of Front Street. Like there's a there's a great east there's a great place over by Antonio's, uh, Big Antonio's, the patio there. There's a big space over there. It um, used to be outside of where the bathhouse was, but that's before your time. That's a lot of some of that is uh, Island Company property as well. Half of it is. 
Oh, that's half on company. Half of it is. Half of it is. Oh, okay. Yeah. Depending on whether or not how you look at the high tide line. <laughs> 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 okay. Um. Not funny. <laughs> I know. Well, I would just like to say, I mean, just as I'm trying to start this arts commission, I'm very much in favor of supporting local artists. Uh, and artsy people, they're artists. And, and you know, they, a lot of them don't typically have those regular jobs and doing whatever because I personally don't have a creative mind, but I, I, but I understand that they are different than me. Uh, so I... And, and a lot of the people that went to the Arts Commission meeting wanted to see, want to see that kind of thing happening, promote the arts. I mean, they're even wanting studio space for artists. So, because all the coastal communities and other cities, even in Abita Springs, Louisiana, they have these food and artisans markets. And they go, and they go very well, and I know you did your research. So I would like to see it continue. Uh, I would like to see it continue. Sadly, there's there's one particular vendor that seemed to bring a lot more of this to light, and and it's very sad. Uh, you know, he's trying to he's trying to make he's trying to make a living, um, but that seems to be the one that that has has really um, kind of stirred this up a little bit more, and I don't know. Some of the I understand he does his own art. I you know I understand he does a lot of that. So I and I don't know to limit some of the products perhaps because they're unique and they're artful versus some that are more like what a lot of the the curio shops are selling the keychains and the mugs and right. I mean I I don't know and I know it's touchy but but that seems to be the biggest. Yeah, I mean, issue. I think what you're referring to is Catalina Printing, um, yes. and that's probably, um, if there was some direct concern, it was probably towards, you know, that particular vendor. Um, you know, gone back and forth with him. I think he'd like to have a storefront operation. He hasn't been able to find one. Um, this gave him an avenue. Uh, we let him in because it was, you know, it was handcrafted art, and he's silk screening on the island, um, so we made that distinction opposed to you know, being purchased and brought over. Um, yeah, I did take some heat on that one. Um, what does he sell? Uh, uh, he's doing uh, printed shirts, printed hats. He's doing printed tile. I mean, anything you can print on, he's you know he's printing on it. Uh, Keychains, those types of things. Um, I think the problem is he's just right in, right not in the close proximity, but right outside the front door of all these other established businesses. Mm -hmm. That's where these people have a hard time with because. They're making money one day a week, and they're paying bills seven, and, and and they're going at operating at a loss six days a week. I, and that's that's the big complaint I've had is like, people aren't really making a great living on this island who have these little shops. They're just barely making it, and they're having a hard time when somebody puts um, up a tent right outside of their right. their door to come in their business. It has another product that doesn't have the overhead that they have. So that's the big complaint, and it's really hard for, for me to say no to that because those are the people that elected me into this office. And um, I can't say no that it, it, it's, a, it's wrong, for, that, that it's okay for these people to be doing this and, and being in direct competition. And, and at the same time, Everybody had a great, a lot of great things to say about you, and they said we don't hold this against Dan Hunky because he's searching through um, everything he can to create more opportunity and more pizzazz in this town, and they really appreciate you. So, what you're doing is a good thing. Keep it up. I don't I, wanna, uh, I don't, thank I don't want to discourage you from thank what you're you. doing. No, thank you. I, no I've way. got a, a couple of them that are a whammies are going to bring to you here pretty soon. So, I hope you're open for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I did ask, you know, if I, if I can, I did ask him to stand down in November. Um, we had a gentleman's agreement that uh, he wasn't going to show in November. Um, the city manager at the time overruled that, um, so we, we did let him in. Um, you know, the, the, right. the market was taking some heat. I, I went to a chamber meeting, went to actually a couple chamber meetings, and, um, you know, that seemed to be where the, the arrows are being slung. 
And um, so did invite him back, and you know, here we are today talking about it again. So I'm looking for some direction. Um, we can alter this um, you know, any way we want to. I'd like to see it you know, move forward at some, some level. Um, but at the same time, I don't want to be necessary up here with three or four vendors on a Thursday night because I, I just don't think it will have uh, draw the attention that we want to see. No, I, draw. I totally agree with you there, too. I need, it does need to be downtown. I know that somebody said, well, why does it have to be on a cruise ship day? Well, that's just to, to you know, that, that's just to get them that exposure when those people come to town. Um, but you can do it on a weekend. Do it on a weekend day. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm just, just throwing well, stuff out there. I don't know. I know the big thing is with the cruise ship and the weekend. I, I don't know. How, how many vendors do we allow, Dan? Um, you know, we thought we'd like to see this grow to 20. I mean, we haven't, you know, we haven't, um, you know, certainly taken a look at a cap yet. The area that right. we're using can house about 20. We had the 10 or 11. Two of the vendors had uh, double wide tents. So, you know, 13 or 14 is kind of where we're at now, um, if you look at it that way. Uh, we have got, we, we, we thought we are seeing some momentum for it to grow a little bit. We've got four other vendors. Um, you know, one wants to do smoothies. The Metropole uh, Cafe wants to do smoothies. Somebody wants to do some baked goods. Uh, we've got another artist that wants to show. And then there was there was one more that uh, expressed some interest. Um, these are all local vendors? There's nobody from uh, Everybody's been over? local except for uh, we had a, a leather vendor um, that came over at the November show um, from San Diego that picked it up and, and, and showed. And I asked... Um, the, go ahead, the city attorney, about could we limit it to just local vendors? And Yeah, because this is public property, um, you have First Amendment rights, which means commercial, um, the ability to compete, this, especially if it's an artist thing, mm -hmm. that can be seen as speech. Um, so when I spoke with the mayor earlier this afternoon, we, I, we do have some research that we've I can dust off to look at this, to look at the ability of the city to restrict local vendors um, to um, this type of event, um, or what ability the city has to uh, restrict perhaps the um, local vendors and or locally produced products and just have a locally produced product. Um, so we can look at that. But again, because this is on public property, um, your ability to restrict once you decide the type of event, if it's going to be an artist event, your ability to restrict people to come to that event if you have space available is severely restricted. So we have to be open. You have to be open. Yeah. I mean, generally, yes. I mean, I can, I can, I, I'd have to dust off the, the research, but generally the rule is um, that if you have space and it's an artist, you can't say that's not art if someone says it's art. Um, or if it's locally produced, or if, for instance, you have food and you, someone wants to come, okay, they want to make um, tamales. No, nope, you can't have tamales because that's not the right type of food that we want. So, again, once you open it up, you got to leave it open. So how, how would you, let, so let's say a bunch of my friends run, the, run first and we say we want to do tamales, 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 or whatever. And then now we've got all food and no art. How, how do we, how do we you, you could actually set up a system, which some cities have done, um, where you have a number of spaces and you say, you know, 10 for food, 10 for artists, and then uh, you have a rotating system. Santa, the city of Santa Monica has a rotating system right. that they use with vendors for these type of things where, um, you know, you're, you're on a list and some Sometimes you do it, sometimes you're not. And, right. and it's just a matter of, you know, it's a rotating thing if you have too many. Right now you don't have that problem. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, what I'm going to, unless our research reveals something different, um, if you've got open space and it's an art for artists, you have to let artists be there. And if it's for food, you have to let food people be there. Okay. 
Yeah, our, our intent was to have a nice blend of the two. Uh, we didn't want to see it get out of balance, you know, by more than one or two on either side. We didn't want this to be a, an art market, um, you know, just an art market, um, and not necessarily just a, you know, just a, a produce. Um, so we were going to try and maintain a balance uh, there. Uh, and speaking to um, vendors coming from over town, we had uh, somebody that was visiting the island. Uh, they caught wind of it. They were there, I think, the day before the October show. Um, and she did um, farmers markets over town and started inquiring about you know what it would take and and just the discussion we had with her and we, we thought it'd be difficult um, just in general but the, you know the time that they sh ship produce over which some of the people are doing um, but the ability to get it from you know Pebbly out there um, park a car or two for a couple people and then you know express over it becomes a little um, Financially inconducive, sure. um, I, I think for a you know four-hour monthly you know right. market. Right. So I, I think that would be really hit and miss on on mm -hmm. over town vendors mm -hmm. coming over. And Vicky Johnson is in the back. Where you did you want to come speak to this for a minute? <laughs> Three minutes. <coughs> yeah, Jim Luke Johnhound couldn't be here, so he asked me to come here. <laughs> Um, because it was brought up at the chamber board meeting in October and so I was just going to read to you what was in our minutes that came up that meeting um, so it's just one paragraph Dan Hunky explained the concept of the new artisans market three criteria were important to organizers farmers market gathering place for the community and opportunity for local artists the goal was to have at least 10 vendors if produce and food product products were allowed exclusively, only a few vendors would participate. The first event on September 26th had 13 vendors and the next market is on October 24th, both on a Tuesday, a cruise ship day. Initially, the market was to be weekly, but now it's scheduled monthly. Jenkins and Hanks expressed a need for a vetted policy, input from the community, not a cruise ship day, and not necessarily on Crescent. Fornasier interjected that a farmer's market is welcomed by locals, but being held on a cruise ship day, they are working and they cannot attend. So that's a big point there. Beauvais agreed with the community's need for a farmer's market and utilizing non-cruise ship day. She also suggested business owners be contacted to hear their opinions. Montano referred to the event as a swap meet of sorts, stating tacos are not necessarily non not necessary jewelry and art are not necessary and a swap meet is not necessary however a farmer's market is needed and then hunky took the discussion in and said that they would revisit the date and place and he also reminded that everybody that that night was fall fest so the chamber board members were definitely not in favor of the artisans market the way it is there was not a lot of positive comments made that day at that meeting. And since then, there's been more comments that have come back to the Chamber of Commerce from other businesses in town that they don't want it on a cruise ship day and that if it's going to be a farmer's market for locals to attend, that, yeah, it needs to be at a time that we can attend because people are generally working on those cruise ship days and they can't go down there and attend. So if it's really supposed to be for locals, it needs to be at a time that locals can be there and maybe it should be a three-month trial where you try it on a Thursday and see how that goes because if it's if it's a local thing not a visitor thing then we should be able to attend and definitely cruise ship days you've got a huge majority of the local population are working on those days um, and something else that came back to us was again the, the whole thing that you know, they're in their brick and mortar stores, they're paying their rent, they're paying their payroll, they're paying the business license, they're paying insurance, they're paying all these things, and they're there every day throughout the year, whether it's a busy day or not a busy day, and now these other ones are coming in and taking from, you know, from their profits because they're only there on that busy day. And so that's where the local retailers are upset by it. And so I, I do feel that that's a good comment to that you should like discuss it with a lot of the local businesses. Somebody should go down and, and ask the different businesses, like how do you feel about this and what are your suggestions for it and see what they say. 
but you know if you in lieu of that you may want to just try it for a trial period of three months on another day that's not a cruise ship day so that's pretty much it I think no those are good minutes you're taking good minutes there Vicki <laughs> <laughs> I, I, again, I, I still feel strongly that the artist should be able to have an, an opportunity to get out there. And if, we, and if it was just vegetables and fruit, just vegetables and fruit, you'd have one vendor, right? Right now we just have the young man who said, so that, that, that's ridiculous to me. But, um, so I think it should have, I think it should have artists and, um, you know, the lady who makes her own coffee, that's that's remarkable, you know. Um, I don't know how strongly, I mean, if, if the community is really saying not on a cruise ship day, because the artists that are there, the local art, the, the people in town that know our local artists can buy their art. They know where they are. The visitor who comes and sees art that isn't being carried in anybody's shops, how are they supposed to get their stuff out there? So I really like them to be able to have a, an opportunity. And one day a month for four hours is nothing to me. I mean, it doesn't seem like anything to me. Um, so I'd like to see the art continue. Like, the, and again, you, we can all discuss the uh, the cruise ship day versus no cruise ship day. If in fact they want to be able to participate and go buy some artichokes, that's wonderful. Um, I think the question comes down is what is the real target market and is the target market those of us that live here or is it the visitors and if it's the visitors we already have a lot of people targeting the visitors the ones that are paying rent the ones that are paying salaries I mean the ones that are in business here at 365 and I don't sure see we're dragging out stuff that will dilute the buying power of our guests over here and I think every dollar I mean people come to Catalina and I'm sure that most everybody that comes here has a budget. And first big swipe of the budget, Catalina Express. Next big swipe is the hotels. Next big swipe is something to eat. Next big swipe is something to do. And eventually you get down to the portion with this, the souvenir portion. And we have more people siphoning off souvenir money that doesn't necessarily stay here, leaves, and doesn't help the community any. It helps the person who does it, but doesn't help the community. I think that doesn't serve the community. It doesn't benefit the community. But I think if we're supporting local artists, because there's not one artist that could support, I mean, I, I don't even know how Ruth Meyer does it with her big old studio there. But the Portia Dennings and the Will Richards and the, and the whomevers that, that hang their stuff at the art gallery, they, I just think, this is a community that we'd like to say is charming. And that is a charming, that's they go, oh man, when we were there, we walked down there and we, we met the local artist. He was, you know, and he was demonstrating how he does his stuff and things like that. I think that's what I would like to see, where they they're there and it's because nobody else is selling their work besides them. And it's boy, I met Portia Denning and look at the beautiful work she does. I think that's that's adding charm to Catalina that people will remember. So that's why, if it's true artist, however you define a true artist, I think that's. I'm not even so excited about a taco. Because, because we get that all the time. But, and there are people that sell tacos. But I think for the artists and the musicians, and then the farmers market concept of the 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 produce and the blended coffees, that's what I like. And I don't know. I don't really care. I whatever we is decided or on the date, if if it's. So it's a day of the week and in in the and the where, where it's at in a place where it's at. But we got to figure well, out. Well, I think Front Street is the only place. It, it it truly is. If we did something smaller, like you featured an artist and a something over by um, Pancake Cottage, for example, you had a musician and an artist there, and they would sign up and do that, and, and then we and then that's another way to way to go, where you're just spotlighting people and then and then doing the grocery part by there or somewhere else I don't know hey Dan were you able to touch any of the merchants down there Did, have you yeah, talked yeah. to any of the merchants along that way on Sumner or, or anywhere else out there um, no I have not gone door-to-door -door. Um, I've 
probably had two of them come to me and say, okay. you know, certainly they're not favorable of what we were doing, um, but have not gone door to door with it. Okay. Well, comments, because there are people in the audience. Hi, hi everybody, and Merry hi. Christmas to you. Thank you. Um, I've been in business in town on the front street for a little over 30 years. And um, I've suffered through winters and springtime with trying to make the rent. And whenever we have these big shows on prime weekends, it takes away from my business. I represent artists all the time. One of the things that I get hit with all the time that you don't think about is for every little event in this town, I get hit up for a donation. Can you donate this? Can you give that? I always do. I want to support the community. I support people who rely on me for their, their paycheck and my own self. And this, this little market is going to grow into something bigger once a month, and it's going to take money and one more day out of my month, and it's not fair. I know how much you think this is cute and nice in Santa Monica, but Santa Monica or wherever has a, you know, hundreds of thousands of people that can go to these places. We have just a very small amount of people here on a daily basis. Right. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Were you planning on having a market in January? Uh, not at this time, depending on how we went. Uh, okay. Okay. Do we want to... Well, we know what, what Katrina's thinking, and Lynn Cameron, I think, is, is kind of the same. Um, I don't know. Council, what's your pleasure? I we can get some more input back from some of the merchants around the area that this has been in hell. I mean, and, then, and then come back to the next meeting or whatever. And well, you know, I think that part of, part of them, I think there's some who really don't care, you know, but... But if this isn't the answer to getting our artists out there, because the merchants, the people who have businesses aren't covering, aren't carrying their their products, and how does an artist survive? That's not, no. I think we local artists. Yes, almost everyone in town, and they all left because they they don't they, they all of a sudden think that we're in business. Oh, so you've tried it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but, but for so for, that's an interesting comment, then, why it doesn't work. But and, and you did point out, Ruth's got a gallery, Porsche's got a gallery, uh, the bank's got a gallery. Now, there are places in town for people to display their art. I mean, it's not that it's a total void out there. And, you know, a lot of the stores have stuff, artsy stuff in them, too. I think there's still I, mean, I think I think what, what's happened, if you go way back in time, when they started the art festival, the art festival was supposed to be an art show. An, uh, supposed to be an art show, supposed to be off season. It was like the third weekend in September, two weekends after the steamer stopped, when the island died. Mm -hmm. And so now what our art festival's turned into is a, a um, craft festival, I think. <laughs> you know, it used to be it used to be paintings and photographs. And then there were some sculpture, and now it's turned into beads and le leather goods and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And then in, in the springtime, the Conservancy's got their, their art fair. Um, so we've got two fairly artsy events already on the books. I don't, I don't, I don't think that there's mm -hmm. not, I think there are avenues out there for local artists, personally. Okay, so how do we want to move forward? Do we want Dan to go get, out and talk I'd like to, to get more input. Okay. Some of the merchants and stuff. Because well, and then and we should also talk to some of the artists. Great, and I, I agree. No, no. Okay. And to see so what, what we're going to bring. What bring would they feel about changing the day? Or I mean, just get all kinds of different information. I don't changing know where we're going with this. I think I know where we're going. With this. this is not going to work. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> no way. I know. No way. There's too many people in this town that already paid their dues, and they're paying them, like. Katrina said it. Yeah. No, I'm not doing this to the people that have been here for a long time. I'm not going to insult them like this and, and, and throw somebody else in competition with them that hasn't paid their dues. I'm not interested in, in carrying it over. But if Councilman Hernandez would like to do it, 
so be it. And then we'll just uh, delay the uh, the bad news for these people till another <laughs> date. I'm sorry, Joe. You're, I'm not laughing at you at no. all. It's not funny. It's, well put, Joseph. Yeah. Uh, okay, so is there direction to talk to artists, talk to a few more business people, see if there's... It, excluding the, the, the food stuff. I'm totally into that. I love honey. I love coffee. I love fresh fruit and fresh food, fresh vegetables, something that would benefit the community at large, something that's not in competition with um, the small people that are struggling to make ends meet. I'm okay with that. Well, I'm glad Vaughn hasn't spoken up. <laughs> and if, as far as the artists, I, I'm sure that their things are charming and they're made with love and a lot of skill and they need to get together with somebody like Greg Miller or one of, or somebody that has a shop or an existing art gallery and need to, they need to patronize those people and get their things in those shops so that those shops become more unique and um, they have more variety and 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 they got to work with the vendor the shop owner instead of um, cutting the corners and it's no no um, don't take this as um, anything that um, you're doing wrong Dan because you're doing everything you're doing right everything Keep keep yeah. those ideas coming because you are an asset to this community. Yep, and for sure. Overwhelming yeah. with with all people, all of us agree that. So yes. that's that's my point of view. But if you guys want to hold it over, that's fine. Let's do that. Dan, do you do you feel like that? It would be that would be beneficial to do. Um, with that direction, um, we could try a February um, and just have foods and drinks and those types of things. Um, and when I say foods, uh, you know, the vegetables, we've had the coffee. Um, you can have tacos. Megan wants to do, you know, Megan wants to do um, smoothies. Um, we've mm -hmm. had some baked goods. Um, nice. Oh, cupcakes was the other one somebody was, <laughs> was asking to do. Um, we certainly could try that. It would be a smaller market. Uh, in the meantime, I can go out to the, you know, some of the, actually I can go out through all of, you know, the front street and put a quick survey. I mean, it's probably pretty inevitable on, on how that's going to go. Um, but we can, we or, can go that route. Yeah. Yeah. What about unique, unique art, like stuff that we know we don't have here. Let's say the leather craftsman. I mean, but I know we just got um, a fictitious business statement that I read in the paper for a new leather craftsman who is here from Catalina, but until she provides her um, her items uh, and puts them forward or, or um, requests getting a booth from you, I mean, things like that. Yeah. Um, if, as long as they don't exist here, I'm okay with it, but I, I'm just, I don't want to get overwhelmed with things that um, are going to be in competition with, with the people that have uh, unique stores as it is, um, especially art stores. Now, there's stuff like, you know, all the all the things that are from China. I I don't know about that. Like plates from China and shot glasses and things like that. I don't really look at that stuff as art. I know a lot of people make their living off that, so I don't want that stuff on Front Street. Um, but I'm really not, you know, I'm not big on on protecting that. I'm, I'm, I'm sending revenue to China for yeah. for their cheap, um, you know, ceramic <laughs> stuff. You know. Yeah. Okay, so, you kind of got direction. I can find plenty of other things to do. <laughs> I know, yeah. I know. Yeah, and we don't want that be burned out. But I would like, I and mean, again, if I, I'm following Joseph on those kinds of things that you were laying out a lot. Again, though, and maybe it's just through, I still want to see what we can do for local artists and musicians so they can be highlighted at some point. But maybe I, the Absolutely. best place to do it is through the Arts Commission and not through community services because we have a lot of people representing private business, artists, and right. whatever, museum, that are all interested in promoting our artists and our musicians. So we'll, maybe we'll do it separately right. then. Yeah, this is getting. This is good. This is gonna. Turn, this is gonna turn out to be something good, for sure. Okay, so did we just change the direction, Rich? No surveys and just do the foods and the whatevers and the whatevers and the and and the and then 
maybe just figure out a day of the week because I guess you don't want the baked goods on Thursdays on on cruise ship days either. Or the, the cruise ship days. I'm, I'm looking to the ladies in the back of the room. So the artichokes and the. <laughs> No, no. So, so if we do it more of just the farmers' market in that arena, right? Right. Exactly. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. And Lloyd's now is going to call and say, "Well, I know what you're doing, cupcakes." <laughs> yeah, and, you know, a farmers' market. You know, on a Thursday in February, uh, it's going to be myself and five other vendors down there, and I mean that'll be it. Yeah. We just don't get the traffic down in Front yeah, Street. The people can't take the stuff back on the boat. They can't take food right. back to the country. Right, right. Because they're going to Mexico. Yeah. <laughs> so if they bought something, they'd have to consume it there. That was a very expensive proposition. Yeah. It was yeah. The, uh, it was who they were getting there, and they were putting from, their which, stuff on the boat and bringing it over, and yeah, and all of that. Money. Where this other gentleman's having it shipped over, it it seems to be it's a little more easier. And it's good stuff. Um, okay, once again, I think I've got my direction. Thank you. Do you? Okay, <laughs> yeah. Dan. Okay. Later, okay. Man. Sorry. Okay. Sorry, that's it. Well, no. That's it. No, we'll no, session. Session. no, no session. session. What? Merry Christmas. No Merry Christmas, Tony. Oh, Jan, yeah. you, you have one more thing to say? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Uh -huh. Merry Christmas, Tony.